This is Space Cats Peace Turtles, the unofficial podcast for Fantasy Flight's Twilight Imperium. Episode 118, Emirates of a Con Strategy Guide. Music by Ben Prunty, featuring Matt Martins and Hunter Donaldson. So uh, we just had a false start. False um, start. We haven't done that in a long time. Okay, so Hunter, you were doing a bit about how you've had too much coffee. Yeah. And then we talked about we didn't want to mince words because uh, we have to. We this we're recording this at five twenty seven p.m. Central Standard Time of Tuesday. Uh, there's your time clock of how long it takes me to get an episode out. Let's see it, exactly what time it posts. But we're we're this one is He's down to fast. the wire. He's crazy fast. Um, you'll yeah. you'll find that out. Um, okay, a couple things to get out of the way. This is an all-business episode. No screwing around, okay? <laughs> Sit down, shut up. Like, this is like the professors. Class is in yeah, session. Yeah, class is in session. <laughs> Your professors are here, okay? We got a lot to talk about, and and it's actually crazy how much we're going to talk about and how much uh, I'm actually about to tell you that we're not going to talk about. Right. Um, no Dune, Harkonnen, Arata. Um, we forgot. This week. Yeah, not this week. Um. So we forgot that we have a system where we were trying to put all of the Dune, um, all of the Dune information on just Dune episodes. We totally spaced on that. So we actually owe you Dune Atreides Errata and Dune Harkonnen Errata. They will be on the next Dune episode. Right. Um, right. Also, the weekend was Buck Wild, so we have no tournament updates for you. Um, we could. Is there anything you want to throw out for him? You said. Um. Well, uh, suffice it to say, things are slowing down in the tournament. So in terms of uh, tournament participants, if you're looking for stuff, there was a new scheduling email that went out this week um, that is scheduling through February 9th. Uh, so, you know, keep keep your eyes on that. Uh, if you haven't already responded, please get in there and respond. Um, check your spam folder. I don't know if maybe because I'm sending out mass emails, they're, they're going into people's spam folders. But I've got a number of people who haven't, I think, hardly responded to any uh, emails. So if you want to be in the tournament, you are slowly running out of time. There's plenty. We're, we're not even quite halfway through, right? We're at we're at 17 out of 36 games played right now. But the goal is to be done by like before the end of February. Yeah. Uh. So so if you were planning to hold out until March, that is unlikely. Um. With the exception that like maybe it bleeds into like the first week of March. Um, for all those people that are kind of straggling right there at the end. We'll, we'll see. I don't know exactly how much it's going to slow down. But, I mean, we did like 12 games the first two weeks. And then we did like not nearly as many the second two weeks. So, right. you know, it is slowing down. But I still want to keep it keep it moving as fast as we can. Uh, because we then still have semis and finals to get to. Right. Um, I would say uh, if you're a waitlister, that goes double for you. Keep your eyes yeah. peeled. This is where yeah. I think we're entering that point where we might start seeing another wave. We had this wave of people drop out, I think, as the tournament started because right. they were like, oh, I don't know why I signed up for this. I actually don't have time to make this happen right. at all. Basically, every time I send out a scheduling email, which is essentially every two weeks, we get a new little chunk of people that are like, oh, yeah, this thing. I forgot. I can't do that. That's crazy. Right. I right. can't have time for a TI tournament. Right. Um. You know, Hunter, I have a fun little update for you. It's not fun at all. It sucks. Uh, but just for people that are going to be looking out for it, as of right now, uh, nine of spades, last year's champion, he had to he had to bail, had no. to bail out this year. There there will be no there will be no repeat from nine of spades. Um, which means as of right now, we only have one finalist in the semis, and we only have one finalist left to play. Uh, that's the only other update I will give is mage. Uh, didn't make it through their round. We'll go over that game next week, but uh, the only one left is Vaunt. Vaunt's got a game coming up, and we'll see if we get two finalists or if Magi will be the lone finalist to make it through to the semis. So interesting. Um, I will say this. Uh, I know for sure that I'm going to put together a... Uh, I, I, and I say I, I mean, like, regardless of what you want, Matt, I'm making this happen. <laughs> I think I'm going to do a little, um, whenever we get done with this tournament, a little finalist v. finalist um, mini tournament. Oh, fun. Where I randomize two games of uh, mi mixing all the finalists up together. 
um, top three from one game versus top three from the other game. Uh, and it's a little too, I know you hate, uh, anything besides winner take all in twilight sure. Imperium, but with, but with these players and it just being for fun, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, yeah. So you can, well, if that. we're just making up new things we want to do, uh, yeah. my goal is to sometime over the summer, do a really fast Franken draft tournament. Ooh, I want that so bad. That would be really cool. We'll figure that one out later. But uh, but yeah. So get, getting through this tournament. The only other thing too is, hey, this Saturday we're doing another Oath stream. If you haven't been watching those, uh, they've been super duper ridiculously fun. Um, so this Saturday's is going to actually be at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We had been doing roughly noon. Last week's was like 12:30. I don't know. We're, we're the the time's going to continue to fluctuate. But we're going to be playing Oath on our Twitch, Space Cats, Peace Turtles. Um, and we'll have myself, Hunter, EJ, and we're kind of working out exactly who the other players will be. But this is all part of our season, what we're calling Season Zero of Oath, while we're kind of learning the, the game. And then somewhere down the road, we're going to like do you know full seasons where we kind of have an arc. Because that's our favorite thing about Oath is this, this idea that like one session impacts the next session. If you didn't watch last week's VOD, uh, there's like deals that are being made that are based on behavior for next game uh which you know in twilight imperium would be like okay well now you're just being weird and metagamey but an oath it's like kind of codified into the game and like makes sense to do and is super duper fun it's very fun uh what i my favorite thing about oath thus far is that Whereas twilight imperium is like um uh it's like a, tr a war of attrition and at the end of it it's like one person won and they get the satisfaction of knowing they pulled that off and then everybody else, they lost. And, and kind of right. the, if they have a good attitude, then basically what they got out of it was like the things they got to do in that game that were cool. In Oath, I feel like there's kind of a like, what's the coolest winner? Like who is the yeah. coolest case for winning right now? Right. Because the win is going to affect the map and how the map changes. Right. And I feel like there was a point in this game we, we played on Saturday where, and I don't want to give it away, I'm not going to spoil any of the plot details, but there's a point where we realize that there is something that will happen that then, uh, as far as the end point of this game, and that very much influenced that. Our right. collective realization that like, oh, this is actually how this game is going to end um, if we all kind of agree to this. Right, we just leaned into it. And, and like, more or less the entire table agreed on a thing to impact the next game and it right. was uh, super duper cool yeah very cool. um but that's a lot of vagueness uh, you should totally go watch that that's it's currently on our twitch but i know that'll be on the youtube yes uh pretty soon so today um we are going to talk about uh probably what the most famous like twilight it is Imperium literally of our time. name yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about our namesake um yep. the hakan the first time we covered hakan we saved it for like almost last yeah it was uh, very late in the faction you know round one guides um and we kind of and... dreaded it if i'm being honest like it yeah. felt like oh wow it's just a lot to talk about when you're talking about hakan yeah um hakan does it is feel very any different better this time yeah hakan is very different between TI3 and TI4, I feel like we talk about this all the time. There's no other faction we compare to their third edition counterpart more than Hakan. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because in both of them, they're so well defined and the differences are so big uh, that I, I just like can't help but have my head go to that space. Um, and I, I think, I mean, our, our original guide ended up being a two part episode. It's the only guide we did where we had to like take two episodes to like make it happen. Right. Um, and that's because the first one wasn't even necessarily a Hakan guide, but it was more a guide about trading, right? Just like how to like kind of regulate trade a little bit. So it doesn't feel like this absolutely wild, um, aspect of the game that you have no control over because part of playing Hakan is getting a way to control that trade. Um, and I think we should say right off the bat, that episode is still kind of pretty good. Uh, I, I'm not going to call it required listening for this episode, but there are going to be some things that we covered in that that we're not going to like be repeating necessarily in this week, in, in this episode. And uh, it's there's going to be some assumptions that we're making that we probably outlined in that episode. So it's worth going back and listening to that because we're going to kind of glaze over some topics a little bit more than we did last time. Right. They're a very theory crafty faction. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say the, what he's talking about is, well, last time we covered Hakan in depth, 
we separated it into two parts. One part was just talking about trading and that's it. We talked about trading just for a whole single episode. And while we generally don't stand by things we said a year ago, like I'm sure right. there's something in there that I would be like, ugh, I've been, that's, that's dumb. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Or like off. Well, especially something. with something with, in regards to trade because like our metas have shifted, right? Like right. that's something that we don't agree with it anymore. But who knows? Six months from now, that might come back. Like that idea sure. might, ha- might sure. resh- reshape itself into fruit. You know, it's like it, it, there's just because we're talking about trade and meta stuff there's like no way to have a grounded conversation about it yeah Um, but last time we tried to detail a few different somewhat consistent strategies and some of those things still hold true so it's worth hearing us kind of outline tactics you can use to get better trading done i agree and i think this is probably one of the only times we'll say this where it's like there's a supplemental episode that is still good uh for the most part and probably still useful to listen to before listening to this if you are obviously at like beginner level or like right. just newer to the game in general um but let's let's get into it let's let's talk about what is uh let's let's do our overview of all of the basics of a con let's right. their starting units or starting tech and their um their home system yeah what we think so uh hakan starts with a pretty wicked awesome start anti-mass deflectors and sarween tools anti-mass deflectors is the slightly lesser of the two right but what anti-mass always does for any faction is anti-mass deflectors sets you up for an early gravity drive that's the benefit of anti-mass deflectors it's not starting with a great ability it's starting with not having to research anti-mass deflectors you get to just go ahead and step right into gravity drive but then obviously sarween tools is great Sarween tools is especially great in Hakan's hands because they're kind of a somewhat production focused faction and money focused. So having that extra dollar right from the get go is uh, super useful, especially around one because our home system sucks. Uh, Generally speaking, there you can late game different things happen, but like in round one and like early game, the home system is is a nuisance. And it continues to be a nuisance uh, if you don't defend it properly. You have three planets in your home system. Um, the only tile in the game that has three planets in it. And it is a 1-1, one, one, a 2-0, and a 0-1. Um, so the, the downside to that being uh, if, if you have your one space stock there at the beginning of the game, you have the lowest production capacity of any faction in the game. Yeah, yummy. It's like my least favorite um, thing about them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you're t- I mean, you're basically tied. There's some other factions that also will have their first space lock on it too, but it, like you're tied for the worst, right? No, nobody has worse than you know. Um, plenty of people have better. Uh, so you're only building four units round one, maxed out, uh, maybe even round two. So that's a thing we're going to have to deal with. We'll talk about that later. Uh, in terms of what units you start with, it's not a bad start. Uh, you have what we call two C4I, two carriers, four infantry. Uh, that's the ideal way to go and take two full Uh, extra systems on round one you also have a cruiser and two fighters so you don't start with a pds you don't you know it's not like a ton of fighters two fighters is not ideal but it's it's enough it suffices you can send one fighter with each carrier as it goes out there and it'll make it a little bit more protected not not especially more protected but you know it it certainly it helps yeah um next let's talk about their abilities uh they're uh, like very very famous for the abilities we're about to outline. I think these are some of the best uh, design yeah. that Twilight, like Twilight Imperium, has ever had. The first one is Masters of Trade. What does that allow people? What does that allow Hakan to so do? So you do not have to spend a command token to resolve the secondary ability of the trade strategy guard. Um, basically, nobody ever wants to spend spend the command token to do the secondary of trade. Yeah. <laughs> so most people rely on the person with trade letting them do it for free. Of course. Hakan's advantage is I just get to. I don't have to ask for permission. I'm getting my commodities. By the way, you have six commodities. Uh, you have way more than anybody else in the game, and you just get them. Uh, right. So you you are by design out the gate ready and rearing to do some trading. Nothing stands in your way aside from other players not wanting to trade with you. That's the right. only thing stopping you. Right. No one can tax you to refresh. None of that. None of that stuff. Right. Um, the next ability is guild ships. Yep. You can guild negotiate ships. transactions with players who are not your neighbor. This is, I think, especially important round one. Becomes yeah. kind of less important as, like, generally speaking, people 
become neighbors with right, almost everybody. Right. But it's a huge deal round one and two because huge. it means you get to just do, I mean, again, you start out the gate ready to trade and you can trade with anybody. So the big thing there being, you know, a lot of times the only person who like really gets a lot of trading done round one is the person who took trade. You as Hakan don't care about that at all. You can have the person who took trade be across the table from them and you can trade with them and, yeah. it's, and you're going to make plenty of money. Uh, basically, a Hakan round one always makes money. Always, right. no right. matter what, you are going to make some money. Right. Um, and the last ability is called Arbiters. Um, Matt, what do you do? You do you think Arbiters is cool? This is a cool ability. <laughs> it's I. It's it's kind of the the biggest addition uh, from TI three, right? And it it's and maybe I'm speaking out of turn. Maybe I forget if if they had any ability to do this. But when you are negotiating a transaction, action cards can be exchanged as part of that transaction. And boy, howdy, do I love that. And also, do so many players hate that? And so many players hate that I love that uh, when they're <laughs> playing with me right. actively because it makes everything take so much longer. But it's because it's such a good ability and so fun to capitalize on. You can sell people valuable action cards. You can buy action cards off of other people um, in any situation where normal Normally, a person's going to do something mean and nasty to you, and like a, a, a normal faction's like, oh, I don't have any commodities right now. I have nothing to give this person to coerce them to go away. Hakan always probably has action. Like, you have all these different tools. You might have trade goods. You might have your uh, promissory notes, and you get to add to that, I have action cards that I could just give you to make you leave me alone. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I feel like... The other application of it is whenever we get to the late game, we're going to stomp somebody thing. I've seen so right. much weird trickery with this ability with the kind of like, but if, but if we can get so-and-so action card to so-and-so and then they play yep. it, then it's literally the reason we see Hakan banned quite a bit yeah. uh, in the tournament that we have right now. Our, our tournament is, has a full ban phase at the start and there's like four factions that everybody wants to ban. Uh, but Hakan is like in that next tier list of like, most people want to ban the factions that are just a nuisance to deal with. You could also throw ghosts, Isarl, and Mentak into that list of like right. the second tier, like two of these we need to get rid of because they're just a pain in the butt. And Hakan, I would say, is the biggest pain in the butt of all of those because their ability to, yeah, just turn these like king makey or king slaying situations, they, they can do that at such a high level that if you are the first person to have a chance at victory, you don't have a chance at victory. They're, they're right. going to find a way to stop you. Right. Well, let's talk about next that just everyone's favorite, <laughs> uh, their flagship, the Wrath of Kanara. What, why are you laughing? What's funny about uh, that? Well, the Wrath of Kanara is just, oh, what a fun flagship to get on the table yep. and and definitely use and use its ability. And yeah, just what like, is that ability? Uh, I, after... I oddly don't know it off the top of my head, <laughs> just for some reason. For some reason, uh, after you roll a die... During a space combat in this system, you may spend one trade good to apply plus one to the result. Now, Hunter, if you'll recall, the last strategy guide that we did uh, was the Sardak Nor. Uh -huh. And kind of off the top of your dome, you don't have to read it verbatim, but like, what is the Sardak Nor's flagship's ability? Uh, it's uh, you, you spend a command counter... <laughs> and you get plus one. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry, that's wrong. You just get plus one. You just get a plus one. Plus one. So the Wrath of Kanara rolls. is the same effect as the Sardak Norse flagship. But it costs money. <laughs> but you have to pay for it. <laughs> so uh, not very good. Uh, it also rolls on a seven, uh, seven which yeah. is not great. Um, it's just it's it's kind of pretty often argued to be the worst flagship in the game. Yeah. Um, the only reason you build this flagship is because you have the the unveil flagship secret objective and sure. even then it might be worth it to just try to get a different secret objective yeah pro it's probably not worth getting the wrath of kanara out um because the other thing too is it's like it's weak so someone might get it uh so someone might destroy it yeah the um, only argument i can put against that is like i mean eight resources and isn't a big deal for you to spend like you're, you're you can probably in the late game have eight resources available but i just don't know why you would want to drop it on that every day of the week i would rather have two dreadnoughts especially because i'm hakan we'll get to this later but you're gonna have dreadnought too almost definitely you know what would and, make it cool is if you weren't limited to one to one if it was like <laughs> essentially the way it worked was if you have a bunch of trade goods you could use the wrath of kanara right exactly. to like for sure win this fight like you yeah. can spend as many trade goods as you have to to get but it is only plus one each time 
So right. it's like if you I can roll... only do it once. You can't spend two trade goods for plus two. It is right. one trade good for plus one. Also, just to just for this extra little an- element, uh, rules lawyers will tell you that because of the Wrath of Kanara, there's like really specific timings on when you are allowed to spend that trade good and how you apply it to results. You have to do it like ship by ship. Uh, it's the it's the worst. Uh, it's the only time in the game, more or less. Someone's gonna call me out on this and say I'm wrong, but it's basically the only time in the game that it matters that you like rolled your destroyers before you rolled your cruiser before sure. you rolled your dreadnought yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? You're you're technically supposed to do that in an order, and nobody does. And the Wrath of Kanara is the only time it is actually supposed to matter. If you're playing at home and you've never had it matter and you've used the Wrath of Kanara, don't feel bad. It's a dumb rule, and you should ignore it. And I'm right. going to be on record saying that, and I right. hate it, and I always hey, ignore it myself. <laughs> pour one out for the rules lawyers right now. You know, they just they keep us all so honest and love you guys. Love you guys. They Loy- fill lawyer- my away. brain with fire. <laughs> oh, I love them. I love them. They're, they're, you know, because I know how to accept them. You know, okay. you just yeah. say, yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that information that you've provided me. Nope, you don't even see you're doing it wrong. I oh, can just, hear yes. in your tone mm. you're doing it right. You go, oh, that's right. Like, that's true. Oh, cool. I didn't think about it like that. It's true. That is true. <laughs> Anyways, well, moving on. <laughs> moving on. Uh, let's um, talk about promissory note, bud. Yeah, they have uh, the promissory note trade convoys. As an action, place this card face up in your play area. While this card is in your play area, you may negotiate transactions with players who are not your neighbor. If you activate a system that contains one or more of the Hakan player's units, return this card to the Hakan player. So you get to give out your ability to trade with anyone to someone else, and it also acts as a support for the throne style protection for you, right? You give it to them. They are not supposed to attack you, but you're giving them the ability to trade with other people. Hunter, this I think this uh, this is one of the most contentious promissory notes in terms of like how people value it i see a lot of people that are like oh it's waste it's super good don't give it out very often and i have to see some people that are just like this is nothing it doesn't matter yeah. whatever where where do you fall on the spectrum mm, um i i think i used to like it a lot and now i don't really care about it yeah i, I don't think i, I think there really are games good. where it can find its value um but you also have to manage that, right? Like you don't want to give it. You don't want to give this to Jolnar. That's a that's a recipe for disaster. Oh, for sure. Jolnar can do way too much with this. Almost any four commodity faction can do too much with this. Um, and then two commodity factions probably don't want to pay enough to get it. They they they're not looking to do enough trading for it to matter. So you're kind of looking for those three commodity factions to get this to. And yeah, it's just kind of like the price will vary from game to game what you can get out of it. I don't think this is something you're seeking to trade versus something like uh jolnar's research agreement or soul's uh military support right Right. you're 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 just maybe it comes up sometimes someone will come to you with a really big offer and maybe you take it but this isn't something you're like trying to wheel and deal with what do we think about our classic trade convoys for promise of protection round one hakan and mentak thing does that Um, still make sense to us I, i think most people generally agree um that it is it is better for uh hakan than it is for mentak again for the reasons i kind of explained the trade convoys doesn't actually do much for mentak because right. they're not like really able to trade very much mm-hmm. and having hakan uh you know having mentak off hakan's back is pretty opening for hakan now i say opening but the, the same time too like the other person is always getting hit by it that's like why mentak kind of wants to do it is that's like hey i can at least encourage hakan to still do lots of trading but there's still a second party in all of those trades that is not going to be willing to trade with you. So it really doesn't even have that huge of an effect to have the promise of protection. It's obviously there, but I, I think it's something that I'm generally still willing to do, whether or not it's actually a good call. I don't know. I think it just totally depends. Uh, as with everything with Hakan, it depends on your table and the meta and what people are feeling. Yeah, I think I think perhaps there are some, like, I would probably do a trade convoys for, like, military support or trade convoys for i don't know like cybernetic enhancements yeah, i feel weird about thing. it for like military support and stuff like that just because that's like a one-time thing for an all-time thing um maybe for a really well-timed research agreement um or yeah. for something else that also gives me a pretty decent permanent bonus and I, yeah. I can't even tell you what i really think that would be but there there are opportunities where it's good um obviously it can it can be kind of a better late game trade 
um, for, for from your perspective. Like you don't want to give it to someone round one and then they're just like unleashed all game um, to go trading with anybody they want. But in, in a late game, if someone wants it, it could bite you to give that out late game because then maybe they have a whole plan to use it against you. Um, but more often than not, you know, you give it to them. They only are able to do like two trades. And as long as you got paid the right amount for it, you might come out ahead. Um, that's all. I mean, again, it's all just like waffly little trades of like, I don't know how much value did you really get out of it and how much did they get out of it? Maybe then right. it was worth it. Right. Overall, it's probably not a big factor in their overall strategy. No. Overall, the, the biggest it, thing is you have so isn't. many other things to trade with. You don't you don't care about your faction promissory note. You're, yeah. you're wheeling and dealing with so many other things that you I, I often forget that I have trade convoys as part of the things I can be offering. Because right. I'm constantly looking at how to milk trading my action cards and working around with my money and all that stuff. So it's like it's just because it's a one time deal. It's not that big of a deal because you have so many other little micro level deals that you're doing every single turn. That's what you're focused on. Yeah, it ranks pretty low. Um, let's talk about their faction tech, um, and we'll talk about the less. The, they're both pretty cool, but we'll talk yeah. about the less crazy one first. Um, right. Tell me about production biomes. My yeah, boy. production biomes has uh, two green requirements, so you need two green techs. And it is an action to exhaust this card and spend one token from your strategy pool. To gain four trade goods and choose one other player, that player gains two trade goods. Um, obviously a good ability. It's a way to just bankroll yourself for free dollars. Except it's not free because it costs you a command counter. Right. So, you know, those things get a little funky. Obviously, the, the fact that it's an action kind of also weighs it back in the other good direction. Uh, a stall is always useful, especially in, in late game uh, scenarios. But I, I rank this as a pretty good faction tech. And if you are, if you are smart, if you are a skilled Hakan player, it can be a really good uh, faction tech. Especially if you get it, if you get like a green skip and can get it pretty fast, that's a lot of money over the course of the game that you can make for yourself. So, right. um, generally, it's decently worth it. The problem with it is that it is competing with your other faction tech, which is generally regarded as significantly better, and you don't have time to get both. Yeah. Um, so before I get into that other one, I, I did want to say this one other thing about production biomes. Yes, it's a I gain four, you gain two. Um, but something that a lot of people were remarking on, we did pre-errata for our Patreoners, and I saw this a few times of people talking about, you can actually generally, uh, depending on how, how the table feels about you, you can turn that into a five and a one, right? You can make someone pay you one trade good to then give them two trade goods. And so you ended up making five and they only made one. Because for some people at the table, they're desperate for any cash they can possibly get, and they will take one, even if it means giving you five. You're right. going to also play with plenty of tables that are not okay with Hakan ever getting that kind of advantage. So this is the start. This is the first time we'll say, yeah. who knows what this actually means to you. Some people are able to play like this. If you're not able to play like that, don't don't come at us and be like, you guys were totally wrong because we recognize that that point can be very wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it totally depends on your group. It's a meta thing, and we're going to talk about meta so much in this episode. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the what's interesting about this 5-1 versus 4-2 kind of thing is it really it really does come down to meta because, yeah, if you're going to use it at all, you have to give somebody two trade goods. But right. generally speaking, you can kind of negotiate with the whole table and be like, I'm only going to give it to somebody that's willing to give me a trade good for it. Right. But then it all just comes down to, and this is kind of the classic thing that we've talked about with Icon so many times, is did the whole table band together and decide to hold you to the fire and just be like, all right, everyone hold. Do not right. agree to this deal. Right. And so much of Hakan meta comes down to that. Is right. that, you know, did you something find that a weak link does. or did they stick to it? Yeah. And like a lot of times on TTS or like in the tournament, for example, that's not really how people play in that space. Right. So we're more used to the space where you can negotiate and somebody is willing to give you a trade good for it, I right. feel like. Yeah, I think generally speaking, that's true. Uh, in round five and six, that's probably totally different. Yeah. <laughs> people suddenly stop trading with Hakan at all and letting them get away with anything in the late game. That is right. pretty universally true. Um, but rounds one through four... It totally depends on your group. Uh, their other faction tech, which is way more reliable, uh, is Quantum Data Hub Node. It requires three yellow, so it's very deep into the yellow tech tree. Um, at the end of the strategy phase, you may spend one token from your strategy pool and give another player three of your trade goods. If you do, 
give one of your strategy cards to that player and take one of their strategy cards. Uh, it's very costly, obviously. Three right. trade goods and a command counter is no laughing matter. But what you gain from it is essentially the Imperial Arbiter agenda. You get to just take whatever... You, every round, you can have whatever strategy card you want. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a lot of games... Not, I mean, well... It's interesting. In Twilight Imperium, uh, all kinds of crazy things happen all the time. Um, so it is hard to say that, like, oh, this happens a lot. Uh, right. But we do, we have seen many times and have heard many times of games that were essentially just decided by Quantum Data Hub Node. Right. Like, and that's it. That's basically what happened was, well, that came out, and then there's nothing. It's one of those few things in the game that can just allow someone to win kind of automatically. Right. It's the closest right. thing, I think, to the... Um, Nalu zero and right. that kind of like well they won and that's it there's not yeah. really another way we can play this well and that's that's kind of the big thing about it too is and we've talked about this with some other techs in the past but like the idea that this this tech isn't necessarily useful until the moment it wins you the game right right when when quantum data hub node is useful it's because you used it you finally got it Right it just before that last round, and then in that last round you used it, and then it won you the game. So it, right. it doesn't follow Hunter's Law, which is an old term we used to use for essentially text that you get to use very often and extract a lot of value from. Right. This is a tech maybe you only use one time in the entire game. Maybe but, you don't even use it. Like right. that's the other. Yeah, thing that's a seen. huge point. Oh my gosh, Hunter, that's such a big deal. Of of, there's plenty of times where I've had it, and the threat of me having it it changes the behavior of the other players to then orchestrate a situation where I don't even actually have to use it or spend the money or anything. Right. Um, I still get whatever I wanted because they didn't end up taking Imperial because they, they you know, know that I'm going to swap it from them or whatever. They don't want to get stolen from and get given just like construction or something bad in the last round of the game. And so then nobody ends up taking Imperial and then it comes to my turn and, oh, look, I get to just take Imperial. Whoopsie doodle. Yeah. Yeah. It's a... Uh... Yeah, it's such an interesting little tech. Um, I was actually going to ask real quick, just I, I know we kind of don't do a lot of rules lawyer stuff like while we are in the middle of a guide, but public disgrace, does that doesn't apply to the timing window of Quantum nope. Data Hub. And by no, that, because I because you mean, pick a strategy card. Yeah, mm -hmm. you when you pick the strategy card is when you play public disgrace. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, has, it holds no bearing on on that. Um, right. Essentially, I mean, what people can do, this the, what the counter really is, is, they let you try to take Imperial, you get public disgraced, and then nobody else takes Imperial so that you can't get a hand See, on that's it. exactly what I was trying to ask, is right. does public disgrace mean that you cannot, during the strategy phase, choose that card at all, like regardless of whether you're using Quantum and Hated? No, no, no. If somebody else takes Imperial, I can still swap into acquiring it. Um, it's just a matter of if the table then decides to run blocker and not pick it at all, then you're in trouble because they, yep. they, they blocked it from you and then they didn't give you the option to swap. Oh, it with I see. Else. Actually, yeah, I completely misunderstood what you're saying. But yes, yes, that makes a lot of sense. However, yeah. that requires a table with like, I don't know. I don't know who a you're playing with. A huge level of coordination. Like you would literally have to be the one and only person that could achieve victory. And they're like, OK, we just can't. We have to stop Hakan and right. only Hakan. And, and that would be the situation hold. where they do that. Otherwise someone's probably taking Imperial right, uh, right. to try to give themselves an opportunity. You're playing with like some samurai or something like that. <laughs> like I can't even imagine who would be able to right. do that. Yeah. Um, so that is that is kind of the gist of everything they've got. Um, in general, um, what we're talking about is a faction that is just so strong but flimsy because of everything being a meta consideration. It's all right. about what you can do to work those abilities. Every single one of those abilities is a thing that is interpreted by different players in a different way, right? Sardak Nor's Exo Trireme 2s, they do what they do. They hit hard, they scare people away, they're really good defensively. None of Hakan's abilities work exactly like this every single time. Right, right. Um, Matt, what do you mean by that they are flimsy, though? Can you kind of explain that to me? What, because what's so flimsy about them uh the fact that uh, we've said this a couple times now but like the table can just decide to take your powers away from you mm -hmm. if no one trades you action cards 
and no one trades with you during the trade phase. They literally re removed all three of your abilities. You're not right. using guild ships, you're not using master of trade, and you're not using arbiters because everyone has decided they don't want to deal with you, which means you are now a vanilla faction. Right. <laughs> that's when their faction tech actually comes in handy, and that's kind of why their faction tech is designed the way that it is. They are both late game techs that give you assurances in some sort of gains. Yeah. Um, but obviously the trade-off to both of them is you need the you need the components to pay for them, right? right? Quantum Data Hub node can be really hard to use because sometimes it can be actually difficult to get three trade goods in the late game. Yeah. That, that can be, if you haven't already banked them and held on to them for a long time, you can run into that problem. I would generally say if you're going for, if you know you're going to get Quantum Data Hub node, get three trade goods and hold on to them and never spend them. Right. I agree. Um, I one thing I want to bring up is the home system problem. Yeah, is that the oh, yeah. Home talking system about is, flimsiness. It's definitely. obnoxious. Um, having three planets is not super fun. Um, the way that the influence and resources is spread out is obnoxious when it comes to production. But I just want to go ahead and throw in some pre errata. This is like a big thing that I think people like kind of go back and forth with on a yeah. con. And I kind of feel like um, I me and Matt and um, Magi kind of all line up here with the same uh, thought when it comes to how do I take care of my home system problem? And I'm just going to read from Magi directly. This is a pre errata for him being a, a Patreoner. Defending the Hakan home system is as simple as protecting the space. You won't succeed protecting the planets. A second space dock with lots of fighters and some carriers slash dreads are all the, and then all three planets are safe. So essentially what's that say, what that is saying is that in Twilight Imperium, it's very hard to protect a three-planet system when it comes right. to infantry. You have to prioritize the space above it because that is just more solid. With almost every other home system, most home systems are one planet. And right. the common thing is towards the end of the game, you're stacking infantry there so that no right. one can do anything about it. Yeah, the general idea is, let's say it's round five and you've all been buying just like two infantry every single round. Just, just two. Well, by the end of round five, anyone with a single planet home system has a stack of 10 infantry on their home system that is nigh untakeable uh, anybody with a two planet home system has five and that's pretty good five per planet you have three three ish right per per uh, home planet right three infantry is not a hard feat to accomplish and not only that you have three but getting them to move between those planets can be pretty difficult so more often you'll probably have one planet with six one planet with three and one planet with one infantry. And then it's like, right. okay, cool. All I need to do, the only thing I have to do to take you out of scoring contention is take one planet from you. Yep. So if you have a single weak link, weak, uh, weak link in your home system, they've got your number. You're done. You're out of it. So because you can't reliably put good big stacks on your home planets, don't don't push for that. Don't make that your focus. Just put a ton of fighters and ships and everything else in the space and make sure they don't get through that. Right. You need you need to be impregnable when it comes to the space battle. A lot of times with a lot of the other factions, you don't have to be that considerate about that aspect, right. honestly. Like towards the end of the game, you can you can afford to lose a space battle above your home system if it's locked down underneath it. Um, also, one rule I just want to kind of call into this. This is a rule that I uh, in watching the tournament, I commonly see like newer players mess up this rule a little bit. Um, but you only build infantry out of space stocks on that planet. That's you cannot yeah. build infantry. So actually, moving infantry around in a system with your space dock is really annoying. Traditionally, right. we build infantry, we move them out. This is like, I need to build infantry on one planet and then later move them to other planets within that same system. Right. It's annoying. It's yeah, very it's, annoying. It, it, annoying is is the, is the nicest way to put it. It can it can be a huge problem, and honestly, in especially early games, it is the most common downfall of a Hakan player. Right. Is is you did everything else right, but it was so easy to go crush your home system. It was just that was the easiest thing in the world for the table to do, and you, you don't come back from that very easily. Right. Um, all right, let's get into the early game. Let's get into rounds one and two. Let's especially let's get into uh, round one strategy card overview stuff um, yeah. and we're just going to talk about them in order um first up is leadership matt what do we think about taking leadership as a con 
it's funny when we were building this, we were both kind of like, I don't know, leadership seems okay. And then the more we talked about leadership, we were like, oh, hey, turns out leadership rules. Leadership is super good. And I kind of want it maybe almost every single time. There's lots of good options for Hakan. So I don't want to go that far, but I put it in like an upper tier. We're not like directly ranking them, but here's the thing about leadership. Um, as we've been talking about, the home system is actually kind of a, a, a struggle, um, and the big, big, big thing that you can do, this is one of the few like known variables about Hakan, is the big thing you can do to help yourself is get a second space dock at home. Uh, it's one of the few factions where we're like, hey, you definitely want to double dock at home. Um, we're not going so far to say you want to triple dock. That was a thing in Twilight Imperium 3rd edition, but in 4th edition, getting two is pretty important uh, right. because your production capacity is just so bad. But as soon as you get that second one, you actually have a manageable um, production capacity. And the easiest way to do that is round one, if you take leadership, uh, you can get a third command counter in your strategy pool, at least a third, maybe more if you want to, but you can get a third and you can do the construction secondary. The big thing to note here is the timing of everything works out super, super clean for you to first action, move out from your home system with one carrier, go take two planets that are adjacent to home. Second action, do the same thing at some other system. And because you go before construction, uh, the second turn for that construction player is usually going to be when they pop construction, which means you've just cleared out your home system of all the necessary things you need to move out. And now it is totally safe for you to actually build that space dock there and leave the command counter there. And most people don't want to do the secondary construction around one because it locks something critical down. For you, you can time it out where it doesn't hurt you that bad. And now you've got that space dock problem out of the way. Round right. two, you get to go into it ready to start like actually reinforcing your home system. Whereas normally it's a thing where like you maybe get the space dock down round two. Maybe you had to take construction. It just is a lot messier and leadership round one is a super clean way to just deal with that problem out the gate. And you get two more command counters on top of that. And if you really want to go crazy, you have a zero one planet that is usually just sitting there. If you can get trade goods before you pop leadership, you can spend two trade goods and that zero one on one more command counter. I don't, depends on if you think that's worth it. If two trade goods is worth one command counter, depends on what you're gonna do, but you at least have the option um, and it can set you on a really nice round two to have those extra command counters. You can get a lot more done round two. Right, I totally agree. Um, the only factor I feel like with this one is you gotta watch that tech secondary. We need, and the thing I think to keep in mind with all of this discussion is we are a faction that starts with three resources, meaning we need to do our trades before tech pops, basically. Yeah, and right. you don't have a lot of... Um, having the leadership strategy card doesn't really give you any kind of leverage over the tech right. person. So you need to kind of pay attention to them um, right. and let that kind of inform you. Has tech already been picked? Who picked it? Are they likely to play tech right off the bat? You know, if it's barony and they might just pop tech right away and get to tech... Uh, I don't know what I do then. Yeah. I feel like I that would maybe lower the value a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Because the, the, the whole reason we're saying that, it's not a command counter problem. It becomes a resource problem. And with Hakan, what we really want to do is we want to do the secondary of tech and we want to do the secondary of warfare. We're yes. one of the few factions that, because we have this sort of somewhat guaranteed opportunity to make some trade good money... Uh, we can generally afford tech and units off of warfare. So leadership is giving us the opportunity to do also construction, but sometimes leadership can cut out one of those other two because right. the timings didn't work out correctly. Right. And I think like if you can accomplish this though, like if you can pull off construction, uh, warfare, and tech uh, secondaries all in your first round, you are going into that round two looking good. Oh, yeah. You you're sucking diesel now. Yeah. Oh, you're, yeah, you're looking <laughs> great. Yeah, I don't know why you said it that way, but yes. That's um, just a new Irish slang I've learned, and I'm trying to use, I'm trying to incorporate it as often as I can. Yeah, okay. Well, um, let's move fun. on. I'm, let's <laughs> I'm, I need to get a, a, out of that. Did I just um, threaten you with yeah. my... <laughs> I'm sucking diesel now. Ugh, I hate it. Let's um, talk about diplomacy. Yeah, Hunter, speaking of stuff, give me I that hate. breakdown. <laughs> what's, um, what's, so, what's Diplo all about? How, so, how, how, how much do you like it? Oh my God, calm down. Um, so diplomacy, <laughs> we're, we're trying something new this time. We don't want to just write off diplomacy imperial. We actually want to talk about why they're sure. bad with each specific faction. It's like a total waste of time that we're doing because it's nice. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We do actually feel like we've been kind of naughty and just kind of skipping the conversation when it comes to diplomacy. Um, 
it, which is weird that we've decided Hakan is the one we want to right. to start this new thing with because diplomacy feels feels especially bad for Hakan. Yeah. They don't have any their tech skip needs round one are negligible or basically right. non existent. Yeah. Um, if you, I guess, I mean, what you could go for transit diodes before you get like. That Before sounds gross. You get <laughs> There's no gravity need to drive. Do like, here's here's the two techs you might decide to get round one: gravity drive or neural motivator. I can't imagine another more important tech round one. Right. Uh, yeah, and it, so because of that, you're not trying to refresh any planets with tech skips to pull off some slick maneuvers. So then the only other thing you're doing is trying to refresh like Abyss Freya or some high resource thing. Right. I just I can't imagine. Yeah. I just I just don't get it. And the other thing too is. The other reason that people take diplomacy commonly is uh, they need some money. They don't have enough money. Well, Hakan, you kind of have the money thing figured out, and it's really right. not worth giving everybody else that extra money in order for you to, you know, get If anything, less. it makes your case worse to make the trade goods, which are the better money. If you have Diplo and you have a Biz Free and you're going to make five bucks, every time you try to come to the negotiating table, every, a lot of times the people at that table are going to go, yeah, but you're already making five extra bucks this round. I don't want to also trade you like six or seven trade goods, you know, like an average Hakan that didn't take trade should try to get about six trade goods, right? They yeah. want to turn their commodities into raw spending power. They just want to turn that into six trade goods. But if you're, if that means you're going to be making a total of $11, there are plenty of players out there that are going to go, nah, I don't want to make Hakan that rich. No, thanks. I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to go trade with somebody else. Um, that, that definitely happens. And the last thing you need is that kind of pressure on you? It's the that's the weird balance of playing Hakan is you want to you want to get rich, but if you get too rich, the table starts to look at you funny and they try to push you out, and then suddenly you've made things worse. So it's always about taking the right amount of gains per round that you don't freak anybody out. And right. diplomacy round one and doing a bunch of trading is a really easy way to freak everybody out. Yep, yeah. and uh, it doesn't save you from a tech round one from a round mm -hmm. one tech it doesn't save you from that either so i mean i just yeah i don't get it um let's move on uh matt do you want to tell me about politics yeah um so politics we're gonna we're gonna really dive into politics actually like a while from now like w later on but suffice it to say politics is is generally just good um but there's also some wacky stuff you can do with politics if you want to um but generally uh, the reason we really like politics and we kind of put it in like an upper mid tier is getting some action cards right away. Uh, it gives you some things that you could potentially sell round one or two or use round one or two. Um, and even a bigger thing is it gives you the speaker token. As a con, we are constantly looking for ways to do little deals all over the place. We're just trying to trade, trade, trade. We're trading commodities. We're trading promissory notes. We're trading action cards. And if we can also sell the speaker token, what even more value. We've gotten so much more stuff. So politics is a really easy way to um, if you weren't able to get trade, you can make some money elsewhere. Um, oftentimes, um, in, in like a pretty standard meta, you know, the first three things that get taken are like tech, then warfare, then trade, right? So, oh, I didn't get trade. Not that I necessarily needed it round one, but um, because they took trade, maybe I take politics and now I have some leverage over the person sitting to my right. right. I can offer the person with trade the speaker token and make a lot of extra money because they're the ones who are going to have the money. Um, it's, it's just a really easy way to make extra cash round one. And it gives you action cards to get started on that part of your strategy. Yeah. Um, I, I love, I think I like uh, the politics pick a little bit better than you, Matt. Uh, I yeah. mean, you, you're saying that you like it, but I, I really like it. Like, I think I would bump it up to... I would probably... I like taking politics almost better than I like taking trade as a con, uh, which yeah. probably annoyed a couple people just hearing me say that. But um, Well, I, and I think there's an argument for it. I think <laughs> this is one of those components where everybody works it a different way. Again, it, it's it's all about what you can do with it. So if it, if it seems weird that politics is getting rated so high... Maybe you're not playing with it the right way. And Hunter, you you like to p really play with politics, and you you can extract a lot more value out of it than maybe some other players can. Yeah, I like getting ahead on the action cards um, for free because I mean yeah. I I tend to go blue green Hakan more than blue yellow Hakan, mm -hmm. meaning that I'm gonna get neural motivator uh, round one, maybe even over grab drive, and then the fact that I'm gonna be going into round two with the speaker token and basically almost full hand of action cards. That's that's ridiculous. It's pretty that's nice. Great. Yeah. Um, 
And like trading action cards is huge. I feel like Hakan in general, round one, there are like a lot of things you could potentially score that most people don't have access to. And I feel like taking politics and sure is like, I'm going to get a very good pick round two. So my round mm-hmm. one strat or my round one advantage just kind of washes over into round two very neatly. Right. Um, right. Let's talk about construction. Uh, construction is, we already talked about the fact that you kind of have a, have a problem in your home system. Uh, so we value construction more uh, than most other factions do. Most other factions are like, okay, construction, I guess. I'm sixth pick. I guess I'll take construction. Um, but this is the bigger reason why we're going to like really knock Diplo and Imperial down a peg is because Hakan would actually love to take construction. Right. So if you're sixth pick and construction construction is what's left, you should definitely take that over Diplo. Holy cow. Because you can drop that space dock at home. Um, and then the big question becomes, what do you do with the PDS? Um I think you do actually want to have a plan with this PDS rather than just kind of plopping it anywhere. Um, it's it's my view that that PDS is most useful in your home system rather than a forward PDS. Um, if you took a planet and then dropped the PDS forward, yeah, that's useful for that system. But Hakan, we're not really expecting to get a Deep Space Cannon, the PDS2 upgrade. And so because we're not expecting to do that, a forward PDS doesn't have like a a lot of mileage, you know, whereas normally like, oh, a PDS in the center of your slice covers seven different tiles. We're not worried about that as Hakan, which means because we're still worried about our home system, the extra defense from our PDS is pretty important. Hunter, you have three planets in your home system. Where do you put the first PDS? I don't think it really matters that much, personally. But just because, like, it's such it's such a crapshoot defending your home system, right. and it is, like we've already established, all about the space, right? So it, it doesn't make a huge difference. I would probably throw it on a planet already with a space dock, right. mostly because if I'm going to lose my home system, if they got through the space battle, I'm already in really bad shape. Right. And I would rather avo- I would rather them take an empty planet than one with my space dock. Yeah. Now, obviously, obviously L1 is yep. the scary aspect of that. But even with L1 in the game, if L1 was my neighbor, I still would rather double down and just say they need I need to encourage them not to go here. If you if you've got through the space battle, you need to go to one of the empty planets and just be happy that I can't score public objectives now. Right. Right. I agree. So, like, I would put it on Aretz. You're two zero. You've got a space dock there already. You get the PDS there. You you double. You know, you get a lot of defense there. I see plenty of people put the first PDS on their zero one planet, uh, and I just I I think it always looks. You think it's going to work out for you, and then you never got the ground forces over to that planet, which means the PDS really didn't. It, they got to fire once, and then they took the planet anyways, and then you're down a PDS. Um, right. So, I, I, yeah, I like putting it on the planets you're going to much more easily defend so that you add to that defense. Because, again, the biggest thing that PDS doing is doing is just contributing to the space, right? right? So, at the end of the day, that's why it's not as big of a deal. But if you can make sure one planet is, like, the one they're definitely not getting, that can be pretty useful. Yeah. Um, so the rest of construction is like your normal stuff, right? Like try to do the secondary, both the things you're doing, all the normal trading you're trying to do round one. You're, you've got six commodities and you need to get them working for you. Um, but yeah, I, 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 that's, if anything, construction being good for Hakan is like the number one reason diplomacy and Imperial bread. There are situations where I'm like fourth or fifth pick and I decide I want construction over leadership or over the other stuff. I, I don't think I'm leaning that way anymore now that I've put way more thought into leadership. But, like, just generally speaking, there have been times where I've picked construction even when I wasn't the last one to pick. Right. Well, I mean, you have to be careful. The thing about construction is I would really like to do the secondary with the con. It's not essential, but I would really Mm -hmm. like to do the secondary of construction as early as possible. So you kind of have to look at who else is at the table and think, is that somebody that's going to play construction around, like, turn one? Because if they are, then, uh uh-oh, then maybe I need to take it so that they don't. You know what I mean? Hunter, you brought this up earlier, and we haven't really talked about it yet, but there is some value in having construction and playing it as your very first action. Yeah. So, yeah, you are a faction that could take construction and play it first turn, and not you don't lose anything by doing that, really. Like, we've already right. kind of established, we're not super focused on a forward dock with a con. We, we right. need, and in fact, it's not, it's not that we're not focused on it. Like, you could do a forward dock. There's not, that's not bad. It's just that 
we have a problem in our home system and it feels like I would rather fix that and then think about, right. oh, what am I, is this going to be a Mechatol play where I need a forward dock near it or whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's there the are plenty safer. of factions out there that are looking for an opportunity to drop their forward space dock round one. It's not many of them, but there are some factions out there, especially whoever took leadership. Now, leadership's going to still have the opportunity, but just like generally speaking, there are a decent amount of factions that wouldn't mind getting that first space dock out. And if you pop it first, there's probably only two people that went before you that might have the opportunity to do it. And you might be um, knocking everybody else out of the opportunity to do it. And, and that has some value. Right. Um, let's talk about probably the most obvious one, uh, the kind of the, the tech to Jolnar, uh, this is trade time. So yeah. pretty good and also pretty straightforward as far as like why it's good. It's how we're going to make that ludicrous amount of money uh, round one. And it's a very safe play as a yeah. con. I don't think it is the flashiest way to play Hakan. And I also feel like it doesn't have maybe some of the like, I don't know. It, it doesn't necessarily shake up to being like the most interesting way to approach it, but it is good. And uh, it just, yeah, it can't be overstated that it's good. Basically. Here's what I would kind of say. You, you were saying it isn't flashy. And I, I would almost push back on that if only to say, if you if you get really clever, and this is especially true um, with like other people that are um, newer to the game, a Hakan can get away with getting a ton of money out of trade round one, which actually ends up being a bit of a problem for them because if sure. you get like let's say fifteen trade goods round one, which is possible as Hakan, if you like really if you do lots of in your favor trades and like the, the table's letting you get away with too much. Ungodly. When the rest of the table then looks at the end of trade and goes, Hakan has fifteen trade goods, you might not ever get away with anything else to the rest of that table. Like no you that might be already you're done, you're out right. of all trade right. negotiations going forward. Um so it can actually be very dangerous to have trade because it just it, it boosts up the amount of trade goods you get so quickly that you start to look like a problem to the rest of the table. It's sort of right. that same diplomacy argument we were just making, um, but it's also something people are expecting from you. So if anything, I think we tend to kind of recommend people play a little bit of a reserved trade Hakan round one. Don't try to go crazy um, and instead try to just like be a very benevolent uh, trade czar, right? Like just get everybody refreshed, you know, try to do fades that are uh, trades that are slightly in your favor, but like mostly try to just keep your meta in check so that everybody's not super mad at you or freaked out by you or anything like that. Yeah. Honestly, talking about leadership as a, as a thing for Hakan though, has made me really kind of feel like I want to lean towards that basically. Yeah. I mean yeah. like trade, trade is good and you're going to get, you know, warfare done. You're going to get some plastic on, you're going to get some tech. Um, you're not going to get that much plastic, though, are you? Because you probably only got the one space stock. Right. You probably did not solve your your production capacity problem. So you've got all this money, and yeah, maybe you scored a, a, an objective, round one. Round one, I feel like, is the least important round to score a victory point right. anyways. So It doesn't I mean, necessarily put you ahead to score round one. Yeah. Because oftentimes you score round one, and then maybe you can't score round two, or you've set yourself back in a way that actually hurts you in, in the long run. Right. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm leaning more and more. I always, as a player, I can't fight my urge to try to score round one, but I always find myself way more spread thin if I pushed myself to score round one. And so if I'm spending all of the bankroll I just made on an objective, maybe that's not actually the best use of my early money. Yeah. I would say that I, I think there's going to be a conversation that happens in my head between trade and leadership and even politics for me personally because right. i feel like a leadership and politics pick is more of a like i have an advantage round one of i get these six commodities and i can trade with anybody so i'm yeah if i don't take trade i'm not going to make near as much money but i'm still going to make a pretty substantial amount of money right. for round one right leadership and politics both help me kind of set up into yeah. the next round and into you the early game in general You've given yourself more kind of invisible advantages. You've given yourself more opportunities to succeed later, whereas, yeah, technically trade goods are opportunities to succeed more later, but you got to use them right, and also everyone can see those trade goods on your sheet, and they are threatened by them. Right. <laughs> and and that's what leadership and politics gets 
over that is, ah, oh, I'm, I'm going to be in a good uh, position next round because of the speaker order, or I'm going to be in a decent position the rest of the game because I've gotten my space dock problem out of the way, mm -hmm. right? You, you get these things that are actual problems for you fixed, whereas trade is sort of a doubling down of your thing that people are already on the lookout for and are afraid of. Yeah, but... I don't know what minimum ten trade goods round one. That's not bad. Right. It's like, pretty that's great. great. It's that's still it's still awesome. very good. We're not trying to say like don't take trade if it comes up because it is still very very good. It's just basically a like don't maybe don't go overboard with trade because it right. it, it, it can hurt you in the long run. But it's still a great pick and you should probably do it. And Hakan is like a very cool round one faction. Like it's yeah. like we're talking. It's really about, their best round. Right, and it's like we're kind of talking apples and oranges here. Like it's a lot of. It's it's just kind of like oh you've got all these great advantages how you want to do it well I don't know how, yeah. how do you want to do this like you're not you're not really going to do it wrong unless you play d diplomacy or uh, right. imperial of the six that you're probably going to pick none of them is a bad pick at yeah. the end of the day yeah. none of them is bad let's talk warfare that's uh, this is an interesting one this one's really interesting warfare can be just like generally good in the in the way that warfare is always good because uh, like hey it lets you take one extra system if if you want. Or, you know, lets you kind of move move your stuff around in a different, more interesting way or whatever. It gets you that extra command counter that you need. Um, but the big thing that we really want to talk about outside of just like the normal behavior of warfare is depending on the timing of things, warfare can let you take Mechatol Rex round one. Sure. Um, now, normally we avoid uh, these sorts of magic Christmas land scenarios. But with Hakan, it is way less random that this happens to you sure. um it's actually decently likely that you'll be able to get a uh gravity drive popped decently early like the only way this isn't going to happen is if technology very intentionally stalls you out and maybe they will because we're talking about the strategy right now but uh you 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 can move a, a carrier forward one and then move your other stuff around do whatever pop warfare and then by the time you've popped warfare tech has probably been played and now you can research gravity drive and you had six commodities and you have a zero one planet so you really only needed to make five trade goods or less if you want to flip your one one whatever like if you make four bucks you can move that newly unlocked carrier to mechatol rex and take the custodians token right now this round round one very easy right yeah i mean it's uh it's it's i will say the the only thing that's a little bit wild about it is uh so i guess we're researching a tech we are taking mechatol so that's 10 that's 10 monies we got to come up with which right. means and we this means we probably had to trade something like trade convoys for like a trade good or something there's no way you didn't take trade and got to trade your six commodities for six commodities you know what i mean like that means you did a one for one with all of your commodities do you feel me? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I, th I certainly think that's possible, right? If if we look at it this way, you had three, you had three bucks, and then an influence, right? We can say you only need one more trade good to get uh, tech, and then you need five trade goods. Oh, you're right. You're yeah for Mechatol Rex. I, I forgot. So because about the... because you have the zero one, that changes all the dynamics. So yeah, yeah literally all you have to do is convert all six of your commodities into um the the trade goods, and right. you can do it. Right. You won't, yeah. you won't, what you won't be doing is building any units on top of that. No And plastic. that's what makes this not a very smart play. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's worth uh, mentioning though, because. Yeah. It's worth mentioning you can do it because, hey, that's a point. It's a point on the board and you can do it. And I think the added benefit to it is um, when I play Hakan, if I want to do the custodian's point, that's all I want to do. Mm -hmm. I actually don't like holding on to Mechatol Rexes, the Emirates of Hakan. You've already got enough people itching to look at you in a funny way and you being on mechatol is just a really good way to have nobody do deals with you um, and honestly taking the custodians point will also kind of do that but you can always round one take mechatol round two be like leadership or diplomacy or politics and then leave mechatol round two and yeah. just get out of the way let somebody else take it you got your point move back into your slice reinforce and coast out the rest of the game you know, the, the here's here's when I would consider doing this. If somebody picked politics before warfare, like let's say you had some sort of weird round 
weird round one, let's say your third pick, this is very like theory crafty right now, but sure. I'm just trying to imagine a situation where I, me, Hunter Donaldson would be like, I'm going to go for this round one Mechatol play. First player picks tech, obvious. Second player picks politics. Whoa, that's kind of weird. Why are you picking politics so early? And now I know that I'm going to be what at worst third pick round two. Mm-hmm. So I think I could do the Mechatol play and maybe get away with it. I right. might even be second pick round round two, meaning I can like probably reliably get leadership and get that carrier out of there, right. not even well, lose any plastic. Th- you can also do this as like a block, right? If let's say that player you were just describing, let's say we're third in picking order and second was Soul and Soul took politics. Oh, Soul's, Soul's itching to get to Mechatol round oh, two. Oh, you're so right. They're going for it. Um, if we take warfare, we can beat them there, get the custodian's point, and then get out before they have anything to say about it. Right. And you could also even make an argument to the table that they shouldn't be super mean to you because, hey, Soul got politics. They were going to get it round two regardless of what any of the rest of you could do. Right. I was just able to make it happen. You know? Yeah. I, I'm, I got Soul one less point. You're welcome, yeah. table. Yeah. I'm doing you all a favor by keep by holding Soul back a little bit. Yeah. I feel like this is like one of the only reliable Roundwood Mechatol like theory crafty things you can come up with outside of the like what I guess there is the ghost diplomacy round one right yeah, is that but what it is all that stuff is is even more costly this is like all the stuff you kind of would already have been doing and you get to make Mechatol Rex part of it because solely because you are Hakan who can generate more trade goods than other people can. Mm-hmm. Everyone else has to like really do a bunch of maneuvering to like get the money in the right spot at the right time. Whereas Hakan, trade and tech are probably popping before you use that last command counter to go move on to Mechatol Rex. Right, right. All right. Let's talk about tech. Um, tech is always good. Always good. Uh, tech is great here for Hakan as well. Um, Let's. We're not going to get too deep into tech paths yet, but uh, we kind of said it earlier. Neural or gravity drive are like your number one gets. Uh, generally speaking, gravity drive is the better one if you're only getting one. But because we have tech, Hunter, do we want two techs? Do we want to spend the money on two techs? Um, I would say no. And uh, I am really into if I'm Hakan, maybe teching first turn. Um. And it's, it's, again, it's one of those things where, like, people are going to want to negotiate this with you. But I actually feel like because you start with a blue-yellow uh, and you're going to you're gonna come into the next round with two blues and a yellow, um, most likely, because you're probably going to get gravity drive, um, it's so, it's too juicy because yeah. it's like, listen, I started with two of the best techs in the game and, and color-wise I'm doing great. Um, and if you got neural, like, well, hey, even more power to you. Um but now I have basically canceled out a lot of the other factions. Um, and also, this is kind of another one that depends on, like, well, you got to look at the thing. Am I actually going to block people from tech? Right. Then Yeah, then. if everybody at your table has four resources in their home system, teching first doesn't hurt anybody. So maybe it doesn't do anything to do it first anyways. But the other thing, too, is teching first to get gravity drive opens up your opportunities of where you can expand to. So maybe it depends on your slice. Maybe... There's two juicy systems that are both two away, and you would rather get those than your less good systems that are directly adjacent to home. So having gravity drive for both of your car- carriers could be really lucrative. I don't know. So there, there's kind of a lot of factors to evaluate here. Uh, it's worth noting, I'm going to play this game again, but we're going to play it a lot faster. Uh, tech round one can also let you take Mechatol. There are two strategy cards you can take to take Mechatol Rex round one as a con. This time, you actually hold off on tech. You wait until trade is popped. You get the extra money, and you're going to buy two tech, and the two tech you're going to buy is Gravity Drive and then Carrier 2. And now you have three movement carrier in your home system that can run over and get onto Mechatol Rex. Now, obviously, uh, this like requires spending $6.00 on tech and then also having more money to get um the influence for the right. custodians point so it's right. not as reliable as warfare but maybe you can get people to pay you for the tech timing maybe you can get people to pay to delay or you can it, it kind of all depends if you can get trade to pop first you might be able to extort some money out of timing tech at the right time but it is significantly more difficult and it is a bit more magic christmas tree land and i don't want to you know yeah i don't want to go down that rabbit too hole. much time on that Yep. Um, yeah, so tech always pretty good. 
uh, just as good for Hakan as it is for and I would not say especially good for Hakan compared to other factions. Right. It's just always good. Um, right. Imperial. What do we think? It's well, it's it's not better than construction, that's for sure, and it's really not even better than Diplo, probably. Um, the one thing I will say is Imperial can be. I mean, what the only reason you ever take Imperial around one is because you're just like, oh, I'm really fiending for another uh, secret objective, and that's cool. Um, the other argument would be we just get set up two scenarios where we're talking about Mechatol Rex round one. Well, in a six-player game, if you're only getting Imperial, that's actually not going to be a... It's not possible if you take Imperial. Uh, but it's just kind of worth throwing out there that a Hakan with Warfare or Tech round one in a four-player game and has Imperial as their second card, hey, that's pretty fun. That's like the last time you'll hear us talk about a four-player game in a strategy guide. But yeah. uh, you can take Mechatol Rex round one, get the Custodian point and score an Imperial point and look super dangerous and threatening to the rest of the table and yeah. never get any more trade goods for the rest of the game. So right. good luck. So that's bad, actually. Um, I, I'm going to use this Imperial spot to just talk about um, a secret objective that you probably don't want that you're probably yeah. going to want to get rid of. Uh, the for faction sure. tech one is really hard for you. That's a lot of tech you're going to have to get in order to get both those faction tech. Yeah. Uh, you're going to need a lot of juicy skips in order to make you're, that You're happen. just not going to be able to do it. The way I put it is if you, if you have two yellow tech skips and a green tech skip, now you can consider getting both of your faction techs. Right. But literally, if you lack any of that, I wouldn't count on it because uh, it's just going to take too long and it's going to be too much out of your way of other important tech you should be getting. If yeah. you're going that deep into both those trees, you're getting no unit upgrades this game. And if a single unit upgrade point comes out, oh, wasn't worth it. Sorry. Right. Um, also, I'm going to say this. This is kind of a weird thought I'm just having right now. but uh, And I've never done this in a game, but uh, Hakan... Uh, so the the worst secret objective is uh, the one where you have to discard five action cards. That one sucks. Hakan is kind of in an interesting place though when it comes to that. Yeah. In that Hakan could like sell good action cards for money that they used to buy bad action cards for, and then right. like just like you know what I mean. Like let's yeah, say got it's a, a great weird hand. funky relationship. I wouldn't even call the five. Ac I mean, the reason you're saying the five action card one sucks is because it, it's just like it always hurts to get rid of like your reactor meltdown and your direct hit or whatever well i mean um, it's like you have a good hand and yeah you're like, it just uh -oh. is the worst yeah it, it, it can feel very very bad it's a very achievable secret objective but it hurts so bad it feels very very costly right. um and yeah like you're saying hakan can kind of make it not costly you can right. make your money off the good action cards cycle them out for bad action cards and then score the point and not feel very bad about it yeah. All right. Let's talk about we we've talked about all these strategy cards. Let's get into the problems that you can run into as a con. And we've already covered a lot of them, but it's worth kind of here in one kind of breath going over all of them so that we know what we're trying to solve, not only round one, but for the rest of the game. What are like the big things we need to be keeping an eye on so that our game doesn't fall apart? I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're gonna talk about right now is relating to that second space stock that you need to get down. Um, because you have a production capacity problem in your home system. So yeah. when we say second space dock, we're most like we mostly mean a second dock in your home system. However, you could sub that out for a forward dock if it's a juicy planet. But then, like like we've been talking about, your home system is rough and kind of undefended, um, or difficult to defend. I shouldn't say undefended; that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But uh, so if you've got a forward dock on Barrig okay, that's cool, and you solved your production capacity problem, but what you did not solve is your home system is defenseless problem. Your home system can still only produce four plastic, and that is pitiful and going to yeah. be kind of difficult. Um, so you've actually written something here that uh, I really like that I'd never thought about before, was leaving, you should always leave a parked carrier at your home system, and this is, I think, simply so that you can move infantry around in strategic ways, yeah. correct? It has. It actually has two benefits. So the big thing is, okay, well, first and foremost, if the first tech we're getting is Grav Drive, uh, we're almost definitely getting Dreadnought 2, uh, which means we have one extra unit that can kind of help some capacity stuff with us. So out on the rest of the board, as our kind of forward fleet, Dreadnought 2 can maybe help us a little bit, which means of our four total carriers maybe we don't need all four out in the open. One can just sit at home. And that's, that one sitting at home, like you were just saying, every time you activate your home system to build, 
that is when you pick up some infantry from the space dock planets and move them to the planets that are that don't have space docks, right? You're cycling them around because it's it's the only time you're putting stuff on those other planets. Because like we said, the rule is when you build out of a space dock, you have to put the stuff on that planet. So what ends up happening is like by round three, you've got big stacks of infantry on one space dock and literally nothing on the third planet. So the carrier there gives us four capacity to pick stuff up, move it around, and kind of cultivate. What you're doing is almost like a Euro game, right? You're, 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 every time you activate, you're doing this little thing where you're moving your ground forces around to help um, solve that, that planet problem. Again, we're not focusing too much on it, but the other benefit that that carrier gives us is four capacity in the home system. In addition to our two space docks being able to hold three fighters, guess what? We can hold 10 fighters in our home system now with a single carrier added to the mix uh, with our two space docks. That is a chunky force. Just one carrier and 10 fighters is enough. If you have extra fleet capacity, which you should, you're going to have a couple more ships in there that, that pack a bigger punch. But it's it's that is a really solid way to uh, hold on to... Your home system space is just that single carrier parked there. Yeah. Uh, one thing actually I want to ask this is a random rules lawyer question. Uh, if your if your carrier's capacity is maxed out, you can't move those infantry around though, right? Or uh, no, you can because the fighters uh, won't have to like hold true. Yeah, they don't get checked until like the end of the space combat or whatever. So you can move stuff around temporarily while because during movement, uh, your capacity is um, maybe i'm misspeaking this it's during space combat your your uh capacity doesn't matter but i don't know maybe we're gonna get called out on this maybe this is our errata for the Akan is episode a, is, 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 is this... if you have your if you're fully maxed out on fighters can you move the infantry my thought was yes but i don't know hit us up milty call us out publicly yeah make yeah. us regret everything we're saying right now yeah, but even is. even if even if uh that is true you can work around that right like you don't have to have a fully maxed out um area like even even two extra capacity gives you the opportunity to slightly cycle around some sure, infantry sure. so it suffice it to say keep an eye on that problem but either way having the carrier helps more than it doesn't help i want to throw in some pre errata that we got from one of our patreoners uh from rj king thank you rj um I am not a fan of the forward dock as a con because the probability of being extorted for reactor melt meltdown is just too dang high to be worth it. But of course, if you are the one to draw it uh, or you draw a sabotage, that's not an issue. Yeah, what are we talking about, Hunter, with this reactor meltdown business? What, what's so, the maybe players might not be familiar with like how big of a deal reactor meltdown is. Sure. So reactor meltdown is an action card. You can play it on any space dock outside of someone's home system to destroy that space dock. Um, it very commonly gets played on Winu after they take uh, Mechatol yeah. Rex and get their free <laughs> space dock because that is not protected by anything. Um, in fact, I just saw that happen in my 100 Donaldson fan club game. Uh, we had Ouch. a Winu. And I had not played with a Winu in ages. Yeah. And they took Mechatol Rex. And then like next turn, somebody was like, all right, it's reactor disgusting. meltdown, let's do it. Um, but you're Hakan. You're always going to have money, meaning that if somebody can get something over you, they know you can pay for it. So, and they know you need to pay for it because your production capacity is kind of your Achilles heel. It's kind of the yep. problem that you have to solve. Um, so I, I, and I would even say RJ King is saying like, oh, you draw a sabotage. So like now I'm good. Um, I don't want to have to spend a sabotage on reactor meltdown. Right. Like that's, that's a weak card for me to have to spend a sabotage on. But like in this situation, you would have to, um, so yeah, I I I RJ King doesn't like the forward dock. I don't like it either. I think that second dock belongs in the home system, and there's just another angle on it uh, to give you some some more fuel for that fire. Right, right. Are we ready to move on to the tech path? I am, and I think tech paths is something that is actually very conveniently relatively easy uh for for hakan I, I yeah. it's not something i'm as worried about with hakan and so i think we can kind of burn through this with some pretty simple advice to get you through it and as a player i just don't think you have to sweat it too much you know when we talked about barony Aletnev, it was like ooh, we have all these options and if we get this tech skip we do this and we have this it's just like really scary sardak nor was the same problem where it's just like oh my gosh what do you actually do hakan it's very very simple uh the very first thing that you should almost always get is gravity drive. Gravity drive round one is helpful. Gravity drive in general is helpful. And you start with a blue and a yellow, which means 
All you need to do is get Gravity Drive, and you now have the unlock for the best upgrade in the game, arguably, Dreadnought 2, right? Uh, so many other factions, it takes a long time to get Dreadnought 2. Now, that's not to say, hey, rush for Dreadnought 2. You don't need it right away, but you have the ability to get it whenever you need it. The second you need that second or third upgrade, Dreadnought 2 is on your doorstep, ready to be bought. Well, Matt, what about Neural? Shouldn't we get Neural round one? Well, Neural is your second option, and uh, <laughs> I, I think it's fine. And uh, if anything, too, it depends on what kind of Hakan you're playing. So now we have to talk about the the two paths, the two options you have as Hakan. Right. Um, and one of them, and Hunter said it earlier, his favorite one is the blue-green path. Um, it is the slightly slower path. Um, mm-hmm. If you have a green script, that uh, skip that's super, super helpful. But even if you don't have it, it is worth going. Uh, you can get Neural either before or after Gravity Drive. Depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and then once you have Neural, you could get Fighter 2 early uh, and start spreading that gum out. And um, really, that's that's an even better way to protect your home system yeah. is give yourself a lot of leeway in terms of how long it takes people to get to your home system. I am so, very much into the Hakan gum to protect your home system yeah, strategy. That's something definitely. I've gone with a lot, and I feel like it is pretty successful. And yeah. a lot of people, a lot of pre errata was consistent with that as well. Yeah, yeah. People like Fighter 2 quite a bit uh, as Hakan. Then you work your way down the green tree. You can get Daxiv. And then before you get Infantry 2, because Infantry isn't really where you're going to make the most value, uh, the reason we're going down green tree is uh, we want Production Biomes. Right. Um, Production Biomes is a good tech. We said we like Quantum Data Hub Node a bit more, but... Uh, if we can get a fast production biomes, especially if we can skip Daxiv to go straight for production biomes, that is like mwah, chef's kiss. That's so good uh, because we can start getting that money right away. Um, so after production biomes, then we maybe get infantry too. Uh, or, and or, that's carrier our, two. Carrier or carrier two. Or carrier two, either either. one, whichever order you want to get them. Maybe you got carrier two worked in somewhere earlier because you really needed the mobility. Um, but your three, I mean, your typical three blue green upgrades are infantry two, carrier two, fighter two. Get them in whatever order makes the most sense for your game. Right. Um, let's talk about blue yellow. Blue yellow is, I think, the riskier one of the two. It's funny that it's riskier too, though, because you start with blue yellow. You know what I mean? Right. It, like it yes. seems like that seems like the most obvious path to go down. But you are not wrong that it is riskier, and the biggest reason is because graviton isn't useful for you basically at all, and so you're having to deal with this workaround of like, am I really going to get graviton? If you have a yellow skip, oh, blue yellow, blue yellow, all day long, forever and ever and ever. I will scream it from the mountaintops. I yep. love blue yellow. Yep. If you have the yellow skip, right? Um, I would take it over blue green every single day of the week if right. I had a single yellow. Well, skip. here, let me throw out. This is kind of the worry, the ca- the counterpoint. Um, this is some pre errata we got from Patreoner Dead Bob, who is yeah. uh, congratulations, Dead Bob, on uh, your recent win. Dead Bob is a semifinalist. Um, this is a uh, quote. In my limited experience playing as a con, only two games, each game, at least one person at the table made sure everyone knew I was not to get a yellow skip and just taking yellow tech made me the bad guy. This is a meta thing, yep. but people it's do not there. like Quantum Data Hub now. It is scary <laughs> to them. Yeah. I mean, people love it when you got, like, when they're playing as it and they have it. Yeah. But it is something that scares people. Production biomes. That don't scare people. Like, people are right. not really scared of a blue-green Hakan. Not to say that blue-green Hakan is weak, but Quantum Data Hub Node is just such a scary tech. Right. Well, blue-green Hakan is the friendly Hakan. Yeah. I've seen people like RJ King and other people make this case of they, they prefer blue-green solely because it gives them more opportunity to make more trades. They get on more people's good sides, and they're the types of players that do much better when they play on people's good sides. I, as a player, am never on anyone's good side no matter what I do. It doesn't matter. <laughs> My personality is not on people's good side, so screw it. I'm going to go for Quantum Data Hub Node and just get the win anyways if I can if I can manage it. Uh, right. So for, for me, it's I get that gravity drive. I probably go straight for Carrier 2 after that. Um, again, if I have the yellow tech skip, I skip to transit diodes. Transit diodes is such a good tech for Hakan yep. because that is another way to solve our home system problem. Rather than having to do all the shenanigans we talked about with carriers and having two space docks, having transit diodes means every round I just move I just move some infantry onto the planets that aren't as well defended. They just go there and we're fine and we right. don't have to think about it anymore. Right. It is such a weight off your shoulders to have transit diodes. It also opens up Mechatol Rex a little bit as an yeah. option for Absolutely. Hakan. In our in our could it can they Rex 
Canet Rex uh, episode that we did. I believe for for Hakan, we said, could they Rex? Maybe. Should they Rex? Maybe. And I feel <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> we're just like, uh, it's possible. I don't yeah. know. It scares us. Transit Diodes is really changes that. I feel like it tilts it from maybe to like, mm, yeah. Yeah. Right, with that right. tone of it. Not like yes. a, yes, definitely. Just kind no, of a, like a, eh, maybe uh, you could go for it. It, it's it's like this. It's like a, uh, yeah. It's like a. It's, it's 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 like this. It's like it's like a. What? Uh. Oh. Uh. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> um. So yeah, you're you're ending up by the end of it. You have two blue. Uh. You can get carrier two. You can get space stock two. Uh. You can get dreadnought two in any order, whatever makes sense. I think carrier two early is is the best opportunity here. Um. But then the end goal is honestly two paths even still within this tree, which is to say, because of all the things you just said, Hunter, about quantum data hub nodes scaring people, maybe you don't do that. The advantage of blue-yellow is you can get one more blue, one more yellow, and you, then you can get three upgrades. You qualify for all of the main tech objectives you want to worry about, and then you don't have to continue down the yellow tree and freak anybody out if you don't want to. Sure. I mean, but... But you gotta though, right? Yeah, you're like, so close to Quantum Data Hub Node. And again, that's just like how you win. That's the way that you suddenly win the game is to have right. that tech. Um, so it's just always worth it. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to, to suggest going down yellow and then not suggest getting Quantum Data Hub Node. So I'm not actually prepared to do that. But if you don't, if you're so afraid of having any advantage, this is the thing I don't get about these meta players that are like, oh, no, 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 you don't want to get ahead because then everyone will look at you funny. It's like, okay, well, if you never get ahead... <laughs> At what point do you win the game? Because yeah. you're not ahead ever. And I know that the argument is like, okay, it's all in the last round, but I don't like putting so much weight on hoping I have the proper swing round in the last round. That's a that's a tough thing to organize all on your own. So yeah. I will take the advantages where I can get them. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, I will say this as as an addendum to, to blue-green. I think that... Like hypermetabolism is just as cool for Hakan as production biomes. Like I will sometimes even think about hmm. skipping production biomes just to be like, I am an economic powerhouse. I have extra command counters on top of all of the other things that I have. Yeah. Like I feel like with a green skip, if you were if it was neural fighter two hyper production biomes, that's so cool. It's a little heavy green, but yeah. it's, it's... that The problem with both of those two, like production biomes and hypermetabolism fill in the same slot in the green tier, mm -hmm. and both of them are one that you get a lot of advantage of, of getting early. Sure. Um, so it's weird to get one and then still later get the other one. Um, maybe if you're getting both in the same round, like if it's a like round you take tech and you skip to one and then use that one to buy the oh, other right. one, that's yep. pretty cool. Totally. Um, but beyond that, like Whichever one, if you're getting them in two s separate rounds, whichever one you're getting second, you're not getting very much value out of. And that's the only reason that it, I, I tend to not end up going for the other one. Yeah. I just don't want to make it sound like we're talking blue green down because I think blue yeah. green. Yeah, no, absolutely awesome. not. Think... It's very good. Fighter 2 is great. Uh, Neural is great, especially for Hakan. There's the whole action card thing. The more action cards you get, the better off you are because uh, you have more trading potential. So nothing wrong with getting Neural. Sometimes, if you're just like going crazy on tech, if you're getting tech a lot, I might add Neural to my blue yellow tech tree sure. just oh, because totally. Neural is I've great. If two tech and two colors isn't doesn't seem like it's coming out, right? or, or just doesn't, uh, well, actually, throwing in a late game neural is almost always pointless. But no, uh, yeah, you, you would need it early to. But to if do you're anything. if you're down to be a gambling man, uh, then yeah, whatever, go for yeah. it. Okay, Hunter, we have reached an impasse. This next section is trading, and we could spend ten thousand years talking about trading uh, with Hakan. So we, we have. have to restrict ourselves. We have to figure this out, and I think we have. Let, let's let's start with what is now going to be the thesis of this episode, okay? And we're going to explain this one thing to everyone and then leave the rest kind of up to them. We'll give a few examples, but this is like a big overarching problem of trying to do this episode because we're already about an hour and a half in, and this episode could go for the rest of our lives uh, trying to talk about trade and the metagame with Hakan. So let's suffice it to say that because every single one of your abilities relies on your relationship with other players and and what kind of player they they are how scared off by certain behaviors they are every single player is different then your number one goal as hakan is to figure out what their limits are and what what 
types of players they are. If you are in a group that doesn't let Hakan get away with anything, then that's a completely different Hakan guide than the groups where they're actually love, you know, they, they wheel and deal with Hakan and they want to make as much money off Hakan as they can. So they let Hakan make a lot of money and they bank on crushing Hakan in the late game or whatever. There are just so many variables here that we literally cannot go over everything. So instead, what we've kind of leaned into is this idea that the only other tool in your arsenal is the fact that because the metagame is an ever-shifting construct, that's what you are trying to manipulate as the Emirates of Hakan. Um, what we have seen, especially recently, is a lot of people proposing these like super goofy wackadoodle trade strategies. We saw Unaligned Magi do this in his tournament game recently where he did this whole thing, and we'll go over it here in a second, but he had this whole weird, wacky, completely new reinterpretation of what you can do when you trade as Hakan. And I have this little play that I want to do too that is like trying to like reevaluate how we do things. And the reason people are coming up with this is because the tools that you are granted with Hakan are the ability to manipulate the meta. And so our big goal as Hakan is every time we sit down to play, it's time to try a new tactic. We have to do something different than what we did last time. Because if we won last time, everybody's going to keep an eye on what sort of negotiating tactics we use. And the second we use those again, nope, you're cut out of the deals. Sorry, saw you do this last time. Not going to allow it. Right. So our whole goal as Hakan is to be constantly reinventing the wheel and coming up with a new way to convince people to give us money. Yeah, so here are basically just like kind of a list of ideas of uh, we're going to start with Unaligned Magi's thing. Um, basically, his tactic, and he he won his prelims game doing this, yep. um, although he even by his own admittance kind of didn't execute it the way that he wanted to. Right, um, right. But the idea is to at some point, now he did it on round one, and I feel like maybe the actual goal is to do it later on, like round three or four. Right. Um, it's very to, bold to do it round one. He, he, he technically did it twice. He did it round one and he did it round three. So oh, he wow, did it okay. right and he did it wrong. Yeah, <laughs> but regardless. Maybe, <laughs> but maybe he maybe that just rounds down to he did it right because I can't believe he was able to do that again. I know. It's insane game. that. It, well, again, sorry, this we is the actually, thing where he did it this one time. He will probably never be able to do it again because well, we'll people see. will see that it's happening know. and be like, nope, got to go. Who knows? Um, He. So what he did uh, is he locked down trade by buying up every trade agreement. Um, it kind of slows down your own income. But what's mm -hmm. interesting about it is it's sort of like you have you've invested. You put a bunch of money in the bank. You've got all these trade goods. You could pop them at any point. All you got to do is take the trade strategy card, right? right. Um, or even you know force somebody else to do it for you in exchange for some of the money. I don't know. There's a lot yeah. of different ways you could do it. What's cool about it is it's like you put a bunch of money in the bank and now no one else can really trade that effectively or right. really at all. Like they yeah. can trade with their promissory notes and that's it. There's no money that's really going to be changing hands until they get you to liberate their right. trade agreements. You shut everybody else down, including yourself, but like you're finding other ways and, and all you've done is, yeah, I've shut myself down for like a couple rounds, but whenever I want to, I can take trade and turn it all back online. Now, the one thing that Mag the thing that Magi says he probably did wrong was at the very least on that first time, the whole goal is take everyone's trade agreement and then leave one person with their own give give the person with uh like four uh re or four commodities give them their you know ex exchange that out buy it buy them off give them their trade agreement back because you need one other person to want to take trade right. because then what that allows you to do is hey i will trade with you i'll give you six for four if you pop so and so's trade agreement. So instead right. of there, there's two ways to do this strategy. You're you're collecting all the trade agreements and you either just straight up lock them down all game, which I actually don't I don't prefer. I don't think that's as effective. But the other method seems pretty good, which is to say you can kind of guarantee another trade agreement pop every single round because every time you unlock someone else's trade agreement, that you give them an opportunity to now want to take trade and then you offer them a good deal to pop your other trade agreement and you just kind of like make a lot more money over the course of the game, potentially. I think all of the gains from this strategy can totally fluctuate and um, when Magi did it round one, the biggest thing I noticed in his game was he actually that he he got a lot of ill will a lot of the table was less willing to do other types of negotiations with him because he basically had to do a bunch of non-binding he broke a bunch of non-binding deals everyone gave him their trade agreements thinking they would get popped and get them right back and then be able to use them next round and he didn't do that he locked down everyone's money 
And so they were kind of mad at him and didn't let him get his way with uh, get away with a bunch of other stuff. So again, these are all risks that you take. But the whole point is he caught he caught everyone off guard. No one was planning on that happening, which means everyone's strategies of how they were going to use trade goods in rounds two and three were thrown out the window because they didn't have any and they had to completely reevaluate. What you do is you throw everybody off, and now they're 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 having to come up with completely new strategies on the fly. And you planned for this. You know exactly how you're going to deal with your less income and, and all of that. So. Just a super, super fun play that, that shook things up. But again, even Magi has said, I don't know the next time I'll do this. Uh, it's it's just like one of those things in your bag of tricks. Right. Um, and then, Matt, let's talk about yours. I'm really excited by your idea. Yeah. Um, this is this, very centered around the political strategy, Carbell. Like right. This, this is something that I, I think we've seen numerous people kind of try versions of this. And this is actually a way more common thing that you see as sorrow players try to do. Um, but I have been recently trying to kind of flesh out a way of taking politics every single round as Hakan and how to make that as lucrative as possible. Here's the general idea of it. First off, um, you you take it, you take politics every single round. If you have the speaker token, you still take politics, and then you're going to give the speaker token to the person on your right. And then next turn, that player, that person who now is speaker, almost definitely isn't going to try to play your game. They're not going to also try to take politics themselves. They're going to take whatever they want to take. And then now you're second in order, you pick politics again. So this has a negative side of you're never getting the advantage of any other strategy card, right? That's That that sucks. And I'm not going to say that that's not, not an impactful thing. Um, you can only get away with the strategy if like your slice has enough influence to reliably buy you command counters. Um, but the other benefit you get is you're taking politics every single round you're getting a lot of action cards and you're hakan so those action cards have real world value that you can extract you can make more trade goods and you can turn those trade goods into command counters if you need to if you're if you're running low on the command counters to do the secondaries of all the other strategy cards you need to do you also uh the, the bigger factor in all of this is what you're doing is controlling the power of the game you're, 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 you're giving yourself an opportunity to adjust the power dynamics. You're going to really make a couple people very mad because there are two people that are picking like fourth and fifth every single round. They're never getting the strategy card that they want. And you're making the, the people kind of right next to you pretty powerful, especially the person to your left is picking second or third every single round and they're not having to do much for it. So there's a few things that you have to like manipulate in this to keep everybody from being just absolutely livid with you. Um, it's my view because you're Hakan, you can trade with anybody. You should only trade across the table at the people that you're making mad because they never get uh, the right strategy cards. Because if you're trading with your person to your left, they're already doing very well because they're getting all the strategy cards they want. And then you're also going to give them lots of money. That seems like boosting them up too much. But that's that's this whole power dynamics thing. You've boosted one person through the strategy card picks. You're boosting another person through good trades. And you're just kind of managing all of this stuff. Whereas in a normal game, those dynamics are shifting every single round. And you have to try to manage those things. And it just gets a little bit overwhelming. This is one kind of constant you can insert into your game and then control everything else around that constant. I think it's interesting, this this idea, because like I sort of did this in the Holiday Spectacular, yeah. but it wasn't fueled by thinking. It was just like, a, I want to control the speaker token because it's fun. Right, right. Um, but there there is there are things that you can do that keep it a good thing. Now, you have to... The, I think the biggest consideration here is your relationship with your two neighbors, because that that's going to be the biggest factor in all of this. There's also some sneaky stuff you can do where... Okay, there's a round where you need to take tech or you need to take Imperial. That's probably okay if if the speaker token is to your right and you take something different than politics. What I have tried to do in the past is then the person to my left, if I can convince them to still take politics and sell me the speaker, I might be willing to pay a pretty high price to continue to keep a lockdown on this speaker order thing. Um, it just, it, I don't know. It depends on what you're wanting to do. The bigger thing though is again, this just throws everybody off their game. It changes everybody's plans and they have to now adjust to you. It can, it can make people mad at you and make them not willing to deal with you, but it can also get you a lot of gains. And it just seems like that's the, the, uh, the Hakan we're seeing evolve is just this idea that like, Hey, 
break the game every time you play. Just completely destroy what people are thinking about you and how right. they how they play against you because that's your number one advantage. Is is you are a meta game faction. You have to break the meta game to 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 win. Right. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree that this is something that is going to shake shake the game up doing this. Um, I do wonder, does it reliably get you the win or is it really just going to like that person sitting next to you? They right. are getting such a cushy deal and you have well, no leverage yeah. over them. You know what right. I mean? Cause you're, yeah, you, ha- you this. have to find a way to keep them in check. You need to have a love hate relationship with them. Um, you need to, m- m- one of my goals would be that per- that person on my left. Um, maybe, maybe I'm not a hundred percent committed to doing politics every round. And every time, it's an opportunity for me to take politics um, when I'm uh, what second in order. I could always let them know, hey, I might not take it right now. If you give me a trade good or two trade goods, I will still take it, and you'll still get to go second or third. You could probably do that every round. Maybe you can get one or two trade goods every round from that person just to keep them also in this order, right? You have to think about those things. I think the one thing that this does throw out of your arsenal is normally we like to sell the speaker token to our right to the player that would normally have to go last and now they're going to get to go first. If you're doing this tactic, you don't really have that leverage because you're the one with the speaker token. And if you take politics, there's nowhere else for that speaker token to go than directly to your right. So you're never going to extract value out of them. Um, The only thing that they're doing is they're knowing that they're reliably either going first or going last every other round. So it's a weird relationship you have with that player. And honestly, I haven't even nailed down how to work with that. Um, So again, this is like an untested strategy, but the point is, I think that's what you do with Hakan, is you go in on these kind of weird, untested tricks that you're just going to try, and maybe it works out because it's kind of the only thing left in your tools. Because again, if you do the predictable thing as Hakan, that's when people look at you and go, nope, not letting you do the predictable thing, and I have the power to stop you because your predictable thing relies on you trading with me. So if yeah. I just don't trade with you, you're out of luck. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um just to kind of like reiterate your points or kind of make the case for this myself. I feel like what's interesting about this is Hakan in general has an easier path to uh, some of the objectives compared to the other factions. I mean, specifically resource influence trade goods. Those objectives are a lot easier for you than they are for everybody. Even tech objectives are not that hard. You have a good tech start. You've got good money. Um, So the idea is you're taking in, an ungodly amount of action cards basically um if you have neural it's literally going to be insane wild so you're selling those action cards like i mean you're basically going to have to otherwise you're just you have to or else you're just burning them Yeah. yeah yeah um so you're selling them making extra money and maybe the idea is that you lock down the speaker token until the rng says hey you could have a swing round now for the win yep. basically exactly yeah exactly like that's all it is it's like you being like every single time it's just like no, i'm gonna keep it here because next round i'm gonna see some more objectives and then i'll decide is this the time that it so it's almost like you found a way like you're basically just saying like you're good enough at everything as a con that you should be able to not even you should be able to win without even really having a strategy card yeah except for that round that you need to pick Imperial or whatever it is, right. you know, I yeah. mean, it'll probably be Imperial. But There's yeah. two big things with the strategy too, that I, I try to think about, which is if I always have the speaker token, quantum data hub node loses a lot of value. Yeah, I don't really no need point. it. It's kind of useless, um, which increase. And, and also I need to make, I need more ways to get some goodwill. So it even it boosts that blue green tech path up quite a bit. Production right. biomes looks a lot better when I really need to get on people's good sides in the late game. Um, I will say so, a sabotage is probably a necessity for this whole strategy, though, because if I watched a Hakan lock down the speaker token for the entire game only to get public disgraced when they finally picked Imperial instead yep. of politics, I would laugh. I would laugh all the way to yeah. the bank. Oh, and, you, and, and the big thing, too, is everyone knows you're doing this. Everyone can't ev- literally all five of the other players at the table can't wait to break this on you. They, yeah. that, like they are looking for ways to screw you over. It's right. definitely a negative meta play um, unless you can just be like a big time schmoozer. And I, I don't even think you have enough to give to make that a reality. Yeah, um, P- you are going to make people mad and it's it's going to be a, a problem for you. I just think you can keep that balanced enough where nobody's like actually crazy mad at you and think we have to do something about Hakan. They're just kind of like, Ugh, every time you do this, it's not helping anybody. Like they're, they're not going to do you any major favors. Right. So I don't know. Maybe it doesn't pay off in the long run. Uh, Hunter, 
Tell me about what that, those are kind of the two big ones. Everyone else, like we would love to hear your wackadoodle Hakan strategies, your your things that are just kind of like, this is my weird theory crafty thing because I, I think the more of these that we get, the the better. And it's just sort of the idea we're trying to to get out there. I mean, the big thing that, that I've seen people talk about is they have these wackadoodle strategies and they can't tell anybody because then they can't use it in the game. So right. we're not trying to popularize your famous thing, but if you've if you've used something in the past and saw great success out of it, we want to hear about it. But Hunter, tell me, you have a funny thing written in here, and I kind of just want you to introduce it. What is uh what's Schroeder's number one Hakan tip? Um, Schroeder had a pretty interesting tip that he came in and Schroeder of course is, uh, you know, pretty well known within the community for being uh, a good negotiator. I think we originally called him the used car salesman of Twilight Imperium. So you'd think like, oh, Hakan, that's like right up his alley, right? Um, which yeah, it's great that you say that because Schroeder's, um, special Hakan tactic is that he doesn't, uh, play Hakan. He doesn't like it. Uh, so he don't he don't play it um and he has a pretty good quote here uh, that i think really sings along well with most of the things we've said hakan's advantages can be easily seen and easily shot down if they look like they'll be a problem i personally think that schroeder doesn't like hakan and can't play hakan um he's he said in fact that he has a very low win rate with hakan because he keeps track of that kind of stuff because of course he does um <laughs> I don't think Schroeder can take that amount of heat. I don't think any player could take that amount of heat. You know what I mean? Right. Schroeder right. comes into a game and it's like, oh, you're like, you know, kind of notorious for making, for being a good deal maker, right. a smart deal maker, and you're playing the deal making faction. Like, that's too much. Yeah. That's yeah, just going to be. The, you walk into the game and people are like, yep, not not working with you. No right. thanks. Get out of here. And, yeah. and that is absolutely, that's what we're talking about when we talk about this problem with Hakan is just this whole idea of, People have their eye on you. Nobody wants you to get away with all the crazy stuff you can get away with. We're at a point where Hakan's reputation precedes them. And so you have to find a way to break that reputation and confuse people and throw them off. Maybe make it look like you're giving away more than you're getting. And then in the late game, you turn that into some other game. That, that That's the big thing behind Magi's strategy, right? If he, in round two buys everybody's trade agreements all he's done is given everybody money and he's currently has no gain <laughs> but what he's doing is banking those trade agreements until the 16 resources thing comes out he ex he takes trade exchanges all of them free point free two points for him and nobody else can accomplish it it's 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 a huge gamble on the late game but like that's the kind of stuff you're trying to unlock you're trying to just break people's ideas of what hakan is trying to do because hakan that just safely deals with everyone every time and washes their commodities for one less yeah you can absolutely do that and that's going to be that's going to be fine but that's also the hakan that most people kind of go all right it's round four time to not deal with hakan at all anymore no more negotiating and then you're kind of really hurting in the last couple rounds of the game wow we have really sprawled out into every corner yep. of the game absolutely. but we still have a, a couple sections to go through um, and we're, I feel like we can kind of go through these quickly because I yeah. feel like a lot of this we've sort of already stated. We definitely have. But let's talk about the mid game real quick. What is our general mid game approach when it comes, or what are the things to remember with the mid yeah. game? Yeah. Um, so the big thing is um, Mechatol Rex, I don't think is a huge factor for you. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, you, 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 you have a really good, awesome opportunity to take the custodian's token, um, but that is about it. Um, yeah. I, I don't like holding Mechatol Rex. Again, it's that heat thing. You can't take the pressure of also being on Mechatol Rex. But you can take that Custodian's point real quick and then get out. So you're not doing that. Instead, what you're doing is you are uniquely positioned to do Stage 2 public objectives. So gear up for that. Invest a lot in the Round 5 and Round 6 late game where you have a ton of trade goods. You have... Uh, you know, just the right planets. You have all the tech you need to get. Like you have the ability to create that economic engine that l lends itself to the stage two objectives. And everybody else might be really just gambling on the lucky stage two, whereas you're set up for like half of them. Right, right. There's like there's kind of a interesting like kind of flow to a Hakan game. I feel like if you're doing it right, um, whereas in in rounds one through three, it's a lot of setup and. I would say it's a time to play nice, um, yeah. not have exorbitant deals. Try and keep the meta on your side so that maybe you can still do deals going into four and five. You're not just getting shut out. And if you do some smart, very good deals in round four and five and get a bank of trade goods going into the stage two objectives, uh, there's a very good chance that the RNG is going to flip over the right card and you are going to win that game because yeah. you are the only one with that amount of money in the bankroll to really make it happen. 
Right. Um, yeah. The two the two big takeaways are keep an eye on how the meta perceives you. Right. Uh, your 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 con game is totally dependent on that. So you either need to keep everything fresh and keep them guessing, or you need to like he just, like Hunter just said like just be really good and easy to work with early on and then turn that into major late game gains. Uh, those late game gains uh, are however you need to make that money work, whether it be actual just like the most ridiculous stockpile of trade goods or you've been consistently investing in really important tech or you have a really nice uh, plastic advantage. You need to get all of those things online because if you don't, if you somehow fall behind, you play too scrappy like I do all the time, it's too late. You you will be absolutely decimated in the late game rounds because you don't have any abilities anymore. No one will deal with you. You don't have stuff. You didn't invest in your economy enough and you're you're a fish out of water. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's basically two very good, very common late game scenarios for Hakan. One is economy got in full swing. They got money. They got plastic. They got tech. They got, you know, healthy command counter economy. All of those things got fully established in the mid game. And now it's too late. There's nothing you can yeah. do about it. Right. Um, and then the other is that uh, maybe maybe economy wise things get weird, but healthy plastic helps you kind of get into a late game style Sardak game where right. it's all about territory grab, basically, where yeah. you're just like trying to bust up. And then what sucks about um, Hakan in these in these situations where it really just comes down to like, does Hakan have enough plastic to try and stop the leader? Is Hakan is not super good at fighting? They just have yep. money. They just have yeah. Plastic. You, that's not much of an advantage. So you're really leaning on that first option of right. You want to have an automatic win. You want to be Hakan, and everyone looks at it and goes, "Ah, oh, crap." We let, we just let them get away with it. We let them do it, and now we can't stop them. There's right. nothing we can do. Right. All right. Whew. Oh my God. That's is that that? Do we have anything else That's we need to say no, about Hakan? We can't. All right. We because there's too many. There's too many more things we could say about Hakan. Right. So give us your feedback. Give us your crazy Hakan strategies. Let us know how wrong we were about the carrier thing. I still don't know. I tried to look it up, but I I'm just not going to bother with it. Right. Suffice it to say, have a carrier in your home system. But there's there's nothing else that can be said, Hunter. Give me a little bit of uh, our schedule coming up. What's yeah. what's on the docket? Cool, cool. So um, if you if you are into our Twitch and YouTube stuff, um, there is a game of Dune that is up on the YouTube page that just uh, got released. Uh, it is a game where I play as Harkonnen, um, and uh, it's pretty fun. It's a very salty game between me and EJ, which is not normal. However, I did <laughs> cut out uh one part in particular where we get really <laughs> mad at each other for a second i cut that out there's still some saltiness there but I, i'll let you know i cut out it got the worst too part. real for a moment and that's you know what that's my right that's what i get to do as the <laughs> video editor is if i'm like you know what ah we don't need this one um let's uh so we've got a couple patreon things to talk about um first thing is we have a our first weird bear segment um this is from billy billy wanted us to bring back the rules quiz Yep. Um, so we are going to do a quick rules quiz now. All right, Hunter. Are yep. you ready? Yep. It's the rules quiz. Yeah. That's All right. The rules quiz. Remember that old jingle. classic jingle? All yeah. right. Hunter Donaldson, the Lizix MindNet player, has three space stocks on the board. Uh-huh. If they gain control of a planet mm -hmm. with a space stock, mm -hmm. do they have to remove one of their current three space stocks to replace the one captured space stock due to assimilation. Okay. Hold. Gonna check one thing. Or do, do I get to check stuff? Can I look hmm. at one? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, give me, give me it off the cuff. You know, uh... let, let's, let, let's just let this be raw, right? Anybody can look up rules and try to find stuff. I wanna know your gut reaction. Oh, I can't remember if it's like with with assimilate. Does it is it a may? Is right. It a... Okay, that's that's pretty critical. All right. Yeah. Do you want me? Do you, you want me to to? I'll, I'll give you that. Um, you don't have to I look don't up the rule book. But you get to look up abilities. I, I don't think it is a may. I I, I you yeah. know what? I don't even want you to read it to me because okay. it definitely doesn't say may. I don't know what it says. Right. But I I don't think it's a may. I feel okay. like it's weird. Whatever it says, and I think that's probably why this question exists. I wonder if it's like. <laughs> must what 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 are you laughing it's just about? it's just funny watching you squirm here it's really good well you know i'm not good at this part um <laughs> okay okay uh so so tell me exactly how the question is phrased real quick because i'm and then okay. i'll just answer right away the lizix mindnet player has three space space docs on the board 
if they gain control of a planet with a space dock, do they have to remove one of their current three to replace the one captured due to assimilate? All right. I'm going to say yes, they do. Okay. Hunter Donaldson? No. <sighs> assimilate is mandatory. Yes. If you have one in your reinforcements. But living rules reference 22.4 allows you to remove a space dock from a system without one of your command tokens, but, and this is the clarification that 22.4 gives, but abilities cannot force you to remove a unit from the board. Okay. So you were you were so close, Hunter. You were I'm giving I'm giving you like a, a, a three fourths point right now because you were Partial absolutely credit. right in why, but that's why this is a dumb, tricky rule, is because there's a there's a little qualifier there in the idea of scuttling units, which is an ability can never force you to scuttle a unit. Yeah. You can be forced to do the ability, but not if it is literally making you remove the unit from somewhere else on the map. What is the verb in... I'm going to look it up now. What is the verb in assimilate? Because I remember there's like a weird verb in there, like one of the ones that I don't like. Yeah. Assimilate. When you gain control of a planet, replace, replace. each PDS and space That's dock that the... is on that planet with a matching unit from your reinforcements. Yeah, those <sighs> replace things are tricky because there's not really a codified replace term in the rule book so it's kind of just a thing you have to like understand what dane meant and that replace doesn't have a you may replace and yeah it's just it's just very confusing um so so there you go you now know a little bit more about our beloved board game twilight imperium and yeah i think uh i think we'll probably do rules quiz a couple times as long as billy wants it's such a quick easy uh, yeah, I mean, thing. really, it comes down to Milty is this terrifying rules devil that uh, just has all this little he just has every rule memorized um, in a way that I've never seen anyone else be able to do. And you can when people message me on Facebook about a rules question, all I'm doing is then just messaging Milty and being like, hey, man, I don't know what they're talking about, but what do you <laughs> got? And Milty's like, oh, it's exactly this. And it's because of this, this, this and this. And you're like cool i'm not gonna remember that but i'll go let them know cool. thanks bud yeah yeah um and uh just to let everybody know if you would like to add a small segment um they can actually be a little bit bigger than the yeah this was quiz. a quick one but yeah and we'll do this more often yeah I mean, yeah we'll, th this, we'll... it's not like this is all that billy, billy gets for being a weird bear right right but if uh if you have a segment that you want to pitch the show uh that you that you want to go for or you just want the special exclusive weird bear t-shirt that doesn't uh, completely exist yet but hey we're getting closer um then please consider joining our patreon uh the weird bear tier is the highest tier it's pretty pricey uh but it is the the highest level of access you can get to me and matt other updates for the other patreon tiers um we have a galactic council poll that is out uh for the next galactic council episode um that is going to close uh sooner rather than later so please come in and vote um that one if you don't remember is all about player profiles. Uh, mm -hmm. You get to choose which which of the players that we haven't covered before from the Holiday Spectacular, either Sean, Alex, or Connor, uh, which one we're going to do an episode on. Um, and again, I said this last week, and I will continue to say this, uh, eh, the, the Galactic Council options will be better going forward. I messed sure. up by having them all be the same type of episode. I realize that is not as much fun for everybody. Um, Another tier I would like to update, um, the Hunter Donaldson Fan Club. Uh, we just had our last Hunter Donaldson Fan Club was on Friday night. Um, I played a mock tournament Twilight Imperium game with the bottom six factions. It was very fun and very silly. Um, if you are a part of the Hunter Donaldson Fan Club or want to join, please send me some suggestions of games you would like for the next poll. I have not put that poll out yet. I probably won't put it out until next episode. Um, but I'm always open to suggestions. Uh, I, I'm going to say this. I'm kind of leaning to maybe do Europa Universalis. Ooh, cool. Um, as there's the, new stuff out, right? Yeah, as the non-board game option mm -hmm. um, because there is a new patch that just came out, and it looks really cool. Yeah. Um, but if you have any other suggestions, you can suggest literally anything, any board game that you can play on TTS, um, any uh video game within reason like i'm not right. I, like it just depends it depends on what it is um but yeah there um, we go. can we can we also say kind of the thing about uh 
you know, if 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 you're voting on that, make sure it's like a thing you want to show up for. Because I recall on that last one, while it was a great game and we loved it, there were also a, a decent amount of people in the chat that were like, man, I voted for Dream Daddy. I really wanted to right. see Dream Daddy. And it felt like most of the people watching were actually the Dream Daddy people. Right. So yeah, if they're... you have no intention of watching the Hunter Donaldson fan club stream, it's not to say don't vote. But, you know, there, there's there's other people that are voting that like really want a specific thing and are intending to be there. So we just want you to turn out. We want you to come to the streams. You voted for them. Come show up and and and, and hang out while while we're playing the thing you voted on. That's and, that's why you did it. Yeah, that's that that's totally fair. Well, and also like you you everyone that is in that tier, you get access to those um streams forever. They will be for sure. in the folder. Yeah, yeah. For maybe you. you're maybe so you're holding on to it for later. Of you don't course. have to watch it right away. Of course. Um but yeah, I'll just it was it was an interesting thing because everybody in the chat was basically like I voted for Dream Daddy I wanted Dream Daddy <laughs> oh and of course those of you that are in the Dream Daddy faction Dream Daddy is definitely going to be on the next poll so who cool. knows maybe maybe next month will be Dream Daddy's month yeah we'll uh, we said this at the top of the show but our Oath season zero episode two is going to be this Saturday at eleven a.m. Central Standard Time uh, and last week's episode will be on the YouTube soon but come hang out uh, on our Twitch and watch us play another game of Oath it's going to be our third out of four games for this run uh, the, so the fourth game will be the final game that we play in this kind of arc right we're going to call the story completed at the end of that game um and so I'm really interested. We, we've really turned it into a thing where we're kind of all invested more in the overall story than we are the game to game scenarios. So I think everything is really going to be feeding into that last game, which means the one coming up this weekend is like the penultimate game. It's going to set up who starts as the chancellor in the final game. Uh, and that is definitely going to be a thing that impacts how we play. Uh, so I, I can't wait. And uh, and uh, I can't wait to make EJ scream at me again. That's going to yeah, be fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, please check out those games. And also, um, just consider, uh, if you don't know what Oath is, like, check it out. Um, there's a it's lot. so We've, good. We have a very good uh, interview that we did with Cole Worley a while back about it. If you just kind of scroll down in the feed, um, there are very good videos on YouTube about it. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in it, uh, check out their Kickstarter and consider uh, supporting it. Yeah, uh, you can also please rate us on your podcast app of choice. It increases our visibility and gets more people playing Twilight Imperium and gets more people excited for Oath and gets more people playing Dune and Root. Uh, and you can also find us on Twitter at Space Cats Pod. We're on Facebook, Space Cats Peace Turtles. And you can join our Discord. Our Discord has lots of fun conversations going on, especially right now. The tournament is going on. We have a lot of moderators. The moderators oftentimes will... Uh, be in on games that they are not moderating uh, to lend backup. You know, we, we usually have one person there being kind of the rules bookie looking up stuff while the other one gets to keep track of the game. But that bookie also has downtime and they tend to be updating people live on kind of the events of what's happening in the game. So the Patreon tournament uh, channel on our Discord is very active during games and is a very fun place to see what's going on. Uh, and you also get a lot of your Patreon benefits uh, when you're on our Discord a lot, a lot faster and a lot easier there. So please come join us there. And there you go. There's there's our two hour Hakan guide. Hunter, last last statement about Hakan. What's what's your what's your big, big big biggest takeaway as Hakan? Um. Uh. They're like uh, good at. Um, they're like uh, they're the ones that are good at trading. Thank you for listening to Space Cats Peace Turtles, and thanks to Ben Prunty for the use of his music. You can find more at benpruntymusic.com and benprunty.bandcamp.com. Pax Magnifica. Bellum Gloriosum. <laughs>